<laughs> oh my well we were streaming what? we just weren't recording yet <laughs> all this amazing uh, dialogue <laughs> well it, it's still somewhere just not in the not in the officially uh the, the audio only so if uh, any oh. of our audio only want listeners oh, hey, want to check like out to, you know repeat anything that i said so far for the re- well, just tell me just let me know I, I think, uh, what is it, uh, something in contingencies? Backups and contingencies. Backups and contingencies, great. the only tabletop sponsored by Batman, and that, that's all you need. By Batman. I mean, he is the king of it. Uh, he's got to be. I mean, know, funnily like, enough, so recently I discovered a series of YouTube videos by multiple people, by the way, which is like, you know, AI voice Batman just explaining a contingency plan for all the characters in existence. Ah, you know, yeah, I, I love those. I, I was like really deep into those for a while and it just turned into like a big old uh, little <laughs> shorts rabbit hole. <laughs> and it was really, they're just so good. I mean, it wasn't even shorts. It was like full like eight minute videos sometimes. Oh, I, I really got yeah. into it. It's what been happened? done. <laughs> what? what happened? Oh, he, he got his video going. Hey. Let me see. Hey, look at the boy. Wait, I'm not wearing my glasses? What the? <laughs> How long have oh, I been blind? I... The funny thing is that he's saying that he's not wearing his glasses. And his screen is appropriately blurred. It's like <laughs> we're seeing through his vision, all blurry. We get to see the world through Sam's fuzzy eyes, and it, it, it's hilarious. But he put the glasses, and the blur is still on. What's happening? Why isn't the blur going? <laughs> this is a weird blur, too. Like, <laughs> are the it, glasses not it doing it? <laughs> That's far from the cold open I was thinking, Sam. I was going to just go off on how oh, I, yeah. I've been lying oh, the entire time. It? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Yeah, you got locked in frame one, man. Ah, sorry, Sam. You are just Yee. an image caught in time. Do got locked <laughs> in that frame, man. All right. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, there. <laughs> I turned it off. Well, hey, tech difficulties are something that we're known for, so that All I right, think maybe, we'll be okay. Break your thing a little bit. I mean, streamers and technical difficulties literally go hand in hand, right? Yeah, it's it's like bread and butter, monkey and bananas. <laughs> you can't separate them. Yeah. That's the new tabletop hitting the scene. Streamers and difficulties. <laughs> anyway. Streamers and technicians. We're recording now, right? <laughs> we are. <laughs> wow. Oh, we're three minutes in. Welcome Acting to the show, guys. <laughs> that sounds cool. oh, oh, yeah, we, we better hit the intro so they don't get uh, bored the, and run I away. I have the right screen up the i've intro? never had two streams i'm gonna sing the power rangers team well well let me know if this uh hits you in a power ranger way oh okay i like that that works we, we got him all right hey. and welcome to dungeons and talk shows the talk show that brings you monsters news home brews and hopefully less technical difficulties than we've had but you know what we're, we're off to a fantastic start with contingencies i am your host orion hell yeah and I am your host, Sam. Sorry, I'm trying to fix this mic or uh, camera. <laughs> you got See, this. This is the price we pay for not being in the same location. This is true. But hello, hello. Well, you know, that's the price of art. If you could call it that. Hmm. There we go. That's acceptable. There is. There's the boy. I feel so short. It- in comparison to this to this camera. <laughs> uh, I mean objectively it's, it's you so are. High. <laughs> <laughs> but you sure yes, uh with us today we have uh how how do you say uh, your name? Is like, I was always like Oh yeah, right. That's Gemini? funny, right? I've seen a lot of people go like Kamanoms, 
but you know it is technically meant to be like common on z you know just like yeah like, like, i always yeah i always go off like the the dragon ball z because like uh it, it's just this capital at the end you could say it was probably more directly inspired by the video game like fighter z right ah okay okay that I'm makes sense z. and the funny part is i want to just come on you know which is uh, my internet name which i use for everything you know internet alias but when i made the reddit account it was already taken so i just okay what do i add here just to be able to create the account already oh that z there you go coming on z yeah and you know what worked. that's a it beats the fuck out of being one of those number whores you know the people <laughs> that just slap on a bunch of numbers on their username X, just X, so X, they X, can secure 420 it. 2.0 oh. <laughs> well, <better>. exactly <laughs> it, the street fighter arcade edition curse i yeah. know it but yeah, it's it, just, it's Reddit wild. became my main platform for posting homebrew, you know. I, let's see, I, I would say I just, you know, took it over to Discord for better recognizability, I guess, since I get my own server now and everything. Oh, you got your own server now? Like, it's, I do, actually. Like, yeah, yeah. Those are re- That's awesome. We'll have to check that out. Cause like, I uh, created I, it around, was it, yeah, October of last year. <sighs> Nice, nice. It's got like what? And uh, about 70 something people. We're getting close to 200 members. Yay. <laughs> you got to celebrate yeah. the milestones, man. Micah's camera is too oh, much absolutely. work for me. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a shame. That's a shame. But uh, yeah, I I saw, well, like uh, we, were, we had IDBN on and yeah. I talked to him about uh, like, who could I possibly get on? He's like, hey, do you know uh, Kamen on Z? I'm like, yes, we've featured his work before. Like, I, it, he does some good stuff. Wow, I didn't even like, mention me, really? I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he went straight for the name drop. And he's That's got awesome. quite a few uh, homebrew creators in his server. So it's like, okay, maybe I'm missing chances by not, like, mulling around in all these servers. But, like, social yeah, media actually, is something enough, that's now important. That you it, now that you mention it. Like, how did we get to this episode right now being filmed? Because you got on IDBN server and talked to me yeah. <laughs> when I put, when I started. Yeah, it's exactly that. Exactly. Yeah. So. But it's yeah, been crazy was, meeting all these yeah. people and all these creators, and you know, it's been yeah, really really I, cool. I, I, I love think it. As I really like episode, like this makes like a the conversions. Yeah, it like. Uh, you're probably one of the first people that we've had that ha- has uh, listened to as many episodes as you have be on the show. <laughs> I mean, to be quite fair, like I, I, I can't say I watched the entirety of the episodes. It was like more like a. Oh, that's close show. enough for me. <laughs> because they they can be long sometimes. Unfortunately, you know, uh, we don't yeah. always have the time. Now. But I'm always checking them out for sure. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You gotta put it on the background. It's no, and nobody got time for not doing anything else while listening. To the podcast. Oh, exactly. Like, like if you got a podcast, are, I'm, podcasts I'm pretty much made ma- made to be like that, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, like it, you throw that on in the car while you're on a long drive to work. You toss that on when you're doing housework. Yeah. Like if you have a set schedule in your mind like i'll listen to podcasts while i'm at work because like uh i work yeah, in a restaurant people do that. so i'll be like in the dish pit doing stuff up and you know in slap on pit. a little podcast yeah good to go is that a there music right it's one of the two i'm pretty sure yeah like i used to do a lot of music when i was initially getting into working and being allowed to use earbuds at work mm. or, uh, alternatives like uh, when i first started out doing that kind of stuff i'd have a speaker and i'd be learning from college classes listening to music there's tons of free college classes online and then like when i started getting into doing D &D stuff more i would learn from people from like a matt coville for example nice or like a you know all, all the D D mats yeah. out there <laughs> all the various mats <laughs> yeah yeah they're, they're, oh there's a lot of them then but, at the very least two of them <laughs> <laughs> at the very then least so it's just like you'd be surprised how much you can get out of just listening to 
uh, content creators that have that good long form content. It just mm-hmm. even as a form of game prep, uh, long form huh? audiobooks included uh, in that. Oh, like, I see what you mean. Long form in the meaning that. Yeah. Yeah. Creepy past. Mm. Yeah, I love like the long like horror stories. Oh, creepy past podcasts. Yeah. Maybe yeah, it's, a, it's a great thing. Or you know, sometimes like crypt, crypt, you know, like cryptids and things like that, like monsters oh. or supernatural. Wait, so creepy pasta audiobooks in this case, like stories yeah. being told. There, there, yeah, sense. there's all kinds of like narrations of like whether it be like a book. Or like someone wrote like a Reddit. Story. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember a Mark Blyer did one. Yeah, before yeah. I think it was pretty popular, right? Like a horror audiobook or something in which he was the narrator. Mm-hmm. You remember that? Happened? Yeah, mm. exactly like that. I listen to a lot of those, just kind of like while I'm working and stuff. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, the last D and D campaign you ran was Grim Hollow, so it's supposed to be <laughs> creepy oh, by nature. Oh, I listen to a lot of ones that's that were, like, awesome. Similar to the setting mm. we were in. Yeah. Oh man, I wish I could do something like being a Grim Hollow campaign. <laughs> that sounds so cool. What the hell? Oh, yeah, it was wild, dude. And he, he mixed in, like, some of Stibble's codex, you know, the one with all the little uh, little critter uh, yeah. buddy, Stibbles. yeah, little companion buddies. Hmm. Wait, yeah, Stibbles or Kibble? Stibbles. So it was just kind of a module that added, like, a pet companion system. Uh, like, think of, like, a familiar, but yeah. you could train it. It could grow oh. it. So expanded familiars. I like the song. Yeah, pretty much like that. Yeah. But they were also like, you could go find them out in the world. Like they're actual like animals and creatures, you know, they exist within those. Okay. Power word, but D and D. Basically. Yeah. Call it you back. only yeah. you could only have one at, in most cases. Yeah. I, mean, it, it I feel like that. if your DM is generous, you know, then <laughs> yeah, like our party, like everyone had like about one, and that was a, ended up being a pretty large party if you consider you know the companions. About I half imagine of the DM play. was like balancing encounters with that in mind, right? Oh, each yeah. one of you got a familiar that is. I mean, I, yeah, as the DM, like it was pretty. Yeah, like, so the companions <laughs> were, were pretty st- like strong in their own right as like a pseudo player, you know, mm-hmm. a slight NPC that I controlled in a way. But did the players have? control of their familiars or did the dm it depends, control yeah. so so we had one uh one character one of our mages who had a um little river dragon awesome tamed and it was like you know basically a familiar they were super super close oh. and you know it gained some benefits from being you know partnered with her it grew a little bit stronger it kind of like uh you know, it was able to protect her in some way. It had slight, like, water abilities. So it was pretty cool, you know. It was probably as strong as, like, I don't know, level three Whoa. character, I would say. Damn. Okay. Which probably level towards the end. I think they got to, what, like, level six or seven? Okay, so you guys were, like, the, hmm. double the levels of each familiar. Yeah, it was about level. that. Yeah. And then there was another one that was mostly controlled by me. Um, yeah. Was this little, if you ever played Monster Hunter. Most uh, of them. Yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, a little Grimalkin cat that decided to join the party and travel with them. I, oh, yeah. I Stonk was a cool little dude. Monster Hunter yeah, Stonk. Cat. <laughs> he was he was in the stibbles you know codex is just like a grimokin that like existed within the world and uh they were in this village and they just kind of saw some of them on the street and we have we had two tabaxis in our party you know so they caught their attention yeah yeah people yeah and they were like oh hello you know what are you doing here weird cat people we've never seen you before stuff like that cat people and you know it i loved stibbles especially because it added like an extra layer of uh culture to like these creatures you know stibbles codex yeah. are companions I don't have yeah. to- oh, it was really cool so shout out to stibbles i love that book um yeah it was a lot of fun to, to look into that 
Wait, 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 wait. I might have seen this before. I just didn't yeah. remember by name. Excuse me. Oh, I, yeah. No, I'm not sure if I've seen this before. Wow, no wonder you're praising this. It looks amazing. Look at this. It was so fun. I love it. Yeah, the a gummy bear companion? Yeah, the only <laughs> book. Oh my god, gummy. And there were so many that fit the theme of like oh, the Grim Hollows world, you know? Really? So I really got to like play them up. That's funny fun. because Stable's Codex, if you just look at it, it immediately looks like, you know, more heartwarming. Yeah, you know, super cute. Cartoonish. But there's yeah, something. Like it had a big con. Grim Hollow is like, it's got yeah. a range then. That's cool. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, and yeah, it's it, funny to it think fun. that like all of the creatures in Stibbles are also like they're monsters in their own way. So some of them I use them as like this could be a combat encounter oh. or it could go, you know, another way. A certain versatility to each stat yeah. block. Because there's annoying. some character some creatures, you know, that are aggressive or, you know, like very territorial or you know, stuff like that. Oh, that's good. Who, yeah. who was tra- there, were, <laughs> there was one moment, especially, there was a Stibbles character. Um, I forget what it's called, but it was basically like a little goblin. And they love to steal money, especially. And Loot they problems. robbed... Yeah, they robbed our party <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, what was it, like 10 gold and like... But they ended up leaving behind like an Electrum piece. <laughs> yeah, those things are just silly. Yeah. And I like they were like, what the fuck? What happened? And they just found like footprints that seemed to be like teleported. <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah, that was weird to investigate. Oh. I, and then like, like we had the the king you know? had one of these uh, familiar basically companions. Um, that was a what was it called? Sorry, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here. But anyway, I, I, I remember was, the name of the game. Yeah, it, it's like it a little Cosmo. wormhole worm. Yeah, Cosmo. Oh, there's an axolotl. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, we had a couple of those. <laughs> that I tragically and or sacrificed. <laughs> Yo, is that, a, is that a living keg? A living yes. AO keg? That's amazing. <laughs> so this is awesome. I love it. Oh, my God. I got to get this book. What the hell? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I would want to get this book if I had money. <laughs> I can't wait to to do more with it oh, in the next man. campaign that I run or oh, no, have man. a DM, you know, in the future use it. Maybe Orion could use it. That would be really cool. Maybe. I really wish I could like not only just have a campaign going on at the moment, which I don't, unfortunately, yeah. but like have it allow homebrew content in any shape or form, man. I mean, that's... Welcome to the nerd militia. For man. someone that's that makes homebrew here. to be allowed to use homebrew in a game is just, yeah. you know, yeah. it's just, ah, oh, yes. God, that is what we it's love weird to going to tables to get homebrew allowed because, like, you got to bring it to the table, and then at first you got to have like the DM be like, "Oh, hey, uh, I'll allow that." So they got to go over it, they got to approve it, yeah. And that's just like a, a process in itself. Hmm. Yeah. And then some DMs are just like, "No, I'm strictly going with like these th- two or three books because yeah. they don't want the headache of balancing out someone yeah. else's shit." Mm-hmm. And that's all right, you know, but me personally, and I think Orion, you know, we both love homebrew content. And as long as it's Absolutely. reasonable and it's not fucking ridiculous, then like we'll allow most things as long as it's, you know, yeah. in line with our story. Yeah. I see a lot of the ends that go like, okay, I'm not going to allow you to use like a full homebrew class, but I will allow homebrew subclasses as long yeah. as you show them to me and I approve them. Yeah. If I yeah. was the Emmy, I would probably start with that. Mm-hmm. Most likely, yeah. I will start doing something like that first. But what I I like to think that I would want to do is like, okay, if I think this subclass is currently like overpowered to shit, <laughs> I'm not gonna just ban it. <laughs> I'm gonna try to tweak it myself to make it not overpowered to shit. Yeah, right? yeah. I usually kind of rebalancing some stuff, you know, because yeah, like I a mean, little tweak. I'm a brewer. I can do it. You know. <laughs> yeah, like, like yeah. any seasoned DM can give a couple good tweaks because like yeah. we, dms are making homebrew all the time any exactly. player i feel like the f- who's no, willing it, to... and speaking on that the funniest no, thing i'm sorry i'm sorry the funniest thing is like you know how many times someone came to me and like oh i love your brews you must be like a great dm and i'm like oh, i never actually dm and they're like what what do you mean you're not a dm <laughs> because usually you become a dm first before you start making homebrew like right 
usually and that's yeah. the thing i feel like so many players have these ideas but they don't know how to balance it right yeah. so like a player who mm. who's willing to be like here i want this in this game is it too strong you know here's my idea can you work mm. with it yeah i love yeah. that i'm like absolutely like we had a player uh in the last game in the grim hollows one who wanted to become a gun mage so you know i did a lot oh, of research yeah. i awesome. like half created him like a subclass awesome gun mage is on demand man yeah it's really oh, absolutely such a cool idea uh, like i know we've talked about a few you know on the show yeah i made one myself as well oh yeah nice but because yeah, i didn't like, want it to everyone just loves it, it you know because yeah. i didn't want it the, because i didn't want it to name it just another gun mage i went i went i went creative you know i went yeah. i went outside the box i call it school of gun magic Oh God! Different. Jesus Christ! Don't <laughs> <It's completely different. laughs> stop this, man! <laughs> uh, I remember this one comment that I got that someone was absolutely indignated. It was like, "Really, gun magic? That's the best you could come up with? Oh, artillery, this, this, and that? Just gun magic? That's it? Like you could feel there was so disappointed." <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I, just, I mean, I just, honestly, it, if it it better. <laughs> it, if it's if it's good enough for fairy it. tale to have entire wizards using gun magic, it's good enough for your campaign. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I could see what they were saying, but it, it, it just, it just, but, it worked. You know, if it works, it works. Honestly, <laughs> as as one of the DMs in the in the nerd militia, I would love to have you in one of our games in the future. You know, I do. Uh, I do kind of plan to continue the grim hollows one to like a part two that's um, awesome oh that'd be and, awesome uh, yeah wow, i kind of so left cool. the, the first arc off on a bit of a cliffhanger and with a death so whew. yeah i love these halloween-esque like... settings you know ravenloft green hollow yeah. it's, it's steinhardt I, I mean, oh my god i really i really hunt. want to run like or be in a, like a monster hunter campaign or an yeah. avatar soul eater like ugh. Yeah. Oh, anime ones. That would be cool. Something. Yeah, like I want like I want something like that, like an isekai kind of situation, level up, solo leveling. Soul something Eater specifically. You know what was, I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Soul Eater specifically was like the Halloween town, you know. For yeah. Real, for real. Oh, absolutely. I was floored when I found out that Soul Eater took place in America because I was just like, dude, how how often do you find a anime that's like set play in like a you know, you know your home country because like everything uh, most anime is like oh hey japan japan school Wait, kids so we took the place in america oh yeah yeah it's set in uh like a the uh deathmeister academy is actually in nevada in the middle of uh the uh i Death didn't Valley. remember that that explains a lot because the academy is like a city right yeah, and it's like I, I thought it was city. hilarious that it was placed it, like it's a moving city that's yeah. placed in Death Valley, Nevada, and I'm just wow, like, okay, Nevada, that's, that's a funny thing because Nevada is also madness combat, you know, for new grounds. Yeah, everything shitty just happens in Nevada. That's just that's how it is. <laughs> Yeah, like shady stuff happens in Nevada, and like creepy stuff happens in, in Maine. Cause like, uh, I live in Maine, so it's like, uh, we we got Stephen King up here writing yeah. all kinds of ghost stories about. And we this just shit. don't mention Ohio ever, dude. Speaking of creepy, oh, we things, don't talk about Ohio. <laughs> just don't ever mention it. Speaking of creepy things, have you heard about the the New Jersey Devil developments? Jersey Devil. The yeah okay so new i am from so, so anyone who doesn't know i am from new jersey right Ripped you know it. i i uh i've loved the jersey devil story since i was like a kid right you know i love like the books about cryptids and mm -hmm. you know anyone who knows me knows i love like supernatural shit so like right. yeah apparently people were you know looking around the pine barrens area where the jersey devil was supposed to have been lived you know when it was a person or whatever so uh apparently the what is it like a town historian or whatever Sorry. found like the house where this family apparently lived and they found like the gravestones and stuff like that so that at least proves that they were like real people in that like some fragment of the story was accurate wow and like i feel like i find that so fascinating 
Oh, I hope I hope my friend over at the Saucy Topic talks about this on uh, on her podcast over there. Shout out to, to Ashley. Oh, that is a oh, really yeah, cool you cool. you told me about that. Yeah. I love that stuff. But yeah, sorry to, to Dude, pull should... away. So is the Jersey Devil gonna be the monster of the week? <laughs> oh no. That would be cool. <laughs> Nope, nope, nope. Oh, awesome. but dude, a new cool connection to this though is uh, the Grim Hollows book has Mothman in it. Ah, uh, <laughs> <that's laughs> yeah. I mean, that's real. <laughs> putting the Jersey Devil as like a boss fight, it, it fits for a one shot. It fits for a horror campaign. It fits for I a lot of stuff. I can see a cryptid D and D campaign. Hell oh, yeah! Oh, let's go. Imagine like a whole. Oh, speaking of modules, I was gonna say like imagine a whole module. Did you guys see, which I think is now the currently the biggest D&D Kickstarter ever? Uh, what was it? Oh. The Crooked Moon by Legends Ooh. of Adventures. It's I like have not full, heard of it. Like, an, yet another Halloween-esque module, but it, it's got a lot of like... I think it completed all, your, all its stretch goals from the Kickstarter. And one of those yeah. stretch goals was like, they're going to have like cryptid stat blocks as boss fights oh nice. dude i love cryptids and like giving them stat blocks is just it actually goes into something that i was kind of working on on the side here i wanted to do like a a dungeon master's guide to netflix and one of netflix? the subjects i want to talk about yeah netflix because like there's so many good shows to kind of like give dms inspiration for their campaigns and one of the first things i wanted to talk on for that was uh, this show called Troll Hunters. It's based on books by uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh-huh. And in Troll Hunters, it's a modern setting, much like, uh, you know, modern day. And magic and trolls, and there's, like, kind of shit going on. But, like, you're still dealing with, like, the normal modern society. So I, I just like the concept of all of that craziness kind of going on. Oh, that's setting. so cool. So it's like, I'm doing one kinda, minute. Holy, yeah, that, it was crazy. That the lends biggest... itself to like the whole cryptid thing, because uh, imagine like you're you have an entire party of just normal everyday people, and they're thrust into dealing with oh, Mothman, man. the Jersey this Devil, Bigfoot. It's a whole setting, yeah. You know? Oh, that's no, so I like cool. I like your idea, man. I think you could you could do a little play on it. It's like the Dungeon Master's Guide to Netflix and Kill, you know. Oh, Netflix man, and I like this. Netflix and kill. <laughs> <laughs> but, Dude, it was dope. Oh, I love it. Uh, the Bard's Shout Guide out. to Netflix. Oh, yeah. I Shout shall out never to the apologize. Crooked Moon Kickstarter. I shall never oh, really? apologize for any of my puns. Never. Uh, I feel like we talked don't. about Legends all of in, Adventures all before. In. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Adventures is really cool, man. Did you, did you guys know about Chuckles? Like the Ghost Clown? Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty much I, the, the I do. I know that made it on the map, you know. That sounds that so cool. Gone viral. Oh yeah, I saw some clips of that. It's that shit like, got Ooh. viral, and he, and he put them on the map, like from the internet, mm. and they pretty much knew to capitalize on that. I was just lucky to be able to capitalize. <gasps> on that oh, right dude. after Halloween, they released the Kickstarter. It was perfect. This is how I knew this: the Legends of Avantures, the ones that made the Studio Ghibli setting. So oh, what? did they? That's awesome. Studio Ghibli side? Yeah, the Obojima Tales from the Tall Grass. Wait, really? Uh, you know what? We talked about that. Like, uh, it must have been like six months ago when we mentioned a Studio oh my Ghibli set. Wow. Yeah, dude. Dude, I almost forgot about that. Holy. I didn't even know that that was a thing, much less nice. that they did it. Oh, maybe they backed it. Oh, hold mm. on. Oh. But oh, okay. before we go deep off into Kickstarter <laughs> Sorry, stuff, anyway. I, deep off the deep like, end. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I kind of wanted Engine to ask you Engine. about is uh, being from uh, Brazil, what is oh, yeah, like yeah. tabletop nerd culture like there? Oh, yeah. Because <gasps> like uh, Brazil is just like a such an interesting place when it comes uh, to nerd culture on the whole, like uh, the mm-hmm. uh, attachment to using like the, the Famicom like way past when other people. Uh, other countries are just like, nah, we don't need the NES anymore. Or like, uh, hmm. I, I think another thing that really kind of caught West, my eye. Like, that, it's a, it's an interesting question because I, I am aware that I'm not, how, how would I say? I'm not an example of the common Brazilian, if you will, even the nerd ones. I'm pretty much an outlier. I, I see myself as an, as an outlier in many ways. But right. 
if I am to think from what I know of what I you know what I, what I would call as the common Brazilian nerd <laughs> from my generation, at least. <laughs> mm, yeah, Brazil is it is definitely funny. Like in a lot of ways, we co-opt, we absorb by osmosis a lot of stuff from the United States. We're pretty much under its wing when it comes to like pop culture mm. and nerd and geek culture. We absorb a lot of what we consume from it. Like the reason why, for example, Dragon Ball and and other animes like Naruto and Pokemon and stuff are so popular over here is because majority of the people who are adults now, you know, closing your in on thirties like I am, like we watched that shit on cartoons when we were little. Why did we watch it on cartoons when we were little? Because it was the big thing going on in the United States at the time, and we just, you know, everything that was going on there was just exported to right. here in many ways, and it, it still is nowadays. But it was like back in the day, like twenty years ago 15 years ago it was a forming factor it was a big factor you know informing a lot of the generation so yeah I, I i imagine like a melting pot you know like a melting pot of a lot of stuff just mixed in that that's brazilian pop culture and nerd culture for you like when you get re like really geek really nerd like people like me who are really into pop culture and really heavy users of pc and internet you know we don't we don't fucking everything bro <laughs> like when you get to that <laughs> point you know everything like i know much yeah. more pop culture and internet and you know all kinds of franchises i know i have much more internal knowledge about that than i do about this stuff i i'm actually doing college you know <laughs> it's to that, <laughs> it is to that level like my professional capabilities my professional knowledge pale in comparison to my amount of useless knowledge from pop culture it's, it's the best. i i feel that and it's just like I, I find brazil as like a nerd culture just interesting because like yeah. uh like the, the Mega Man comics were like primarily uh produced there and like i huh. uh, kind of like uh went off on like their their own like full tangent it because of like Man something comics? during the production process like the aren't you yeah like yeah, yeah, the the art during like uh, the early days of uh, the Mega Man comics. I, I oh, I'm I not sure if it was the, involved in there. Oh. Yeah, like uh, there's a full documentary on YouTube that someone put up uh, years ago, and it just oh. I found that fascinating. Hmm. It wouldn't surprise me to be honest. <laughs> I didn't know about <laughs> it, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's one of the things that kind of like caught my eye. I was like, oh, hey, he's from Brazil. Like they have an interesting nerd culture. And it's just like, yeah, you know, has a lot going on. Spokesman for all of Brazil's nerd culture, you know, I we can only <laughs> take your full word for, you know, any of this. And, you I know, speaking <laughs> about Brazil, you know, I mean, you know, being a long time your favorite type of homebrew would be cocktail. Mm. Ooh, my that is favorite a type question. of homebrew to create i mean yeah like i was gonna say that i think the one thing that really <laughs> let me put it in a word that, that sounds funny the one thing that really prevents the majority of brazilian nerds from really unleashing their true power on the rest of the internet is the language barrier it is the language barrier. <laughs> if every brazilian knew like every brazilian nerd geek etc knew how to speak english man <laughs> they'd be on top. You have no idea, man. Shit is crazy. Like ah, shit. It, it, maybe maybe we need open. to start uh, teaching uh, some English down there. Get we'll we'll go down. We'll start no like idea, a, a whole nerd. It, it, we'll, yeah, we'll start like a little nerd uh, army, a, a army. nerd college to just <laughs> cultivate. <laughs> Bardy College of Homebrew. And like, oh, yeah. I remember Kolioko. I remember <laughs> I watched it on TV as well. Mm. Man. It's like it I was sure glued was on the TV when I was a kid. Now I'm glued to the PC. Mm. So there's always a screen in front of me, pretty much. Ah, uh, dude, it blows my mind that Code Lyoko is French. I know, right? Oh, yeah, it was to this day. For French people, right? Now that you mention it, I didn't even remember. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, I'll hop right into that. Oh, yeah. This is TNF, bringing you nerd news. <laughs> so, yeah, a little late to the show. I held off on this one last week for nerd news, but 
Wizards of the Coast is they're doing away with Portuguese translations for their books. They they don't want to sell things in in the Portugal tongue anymore. <laughs> apparently, Damn. I know, right? What a bold it's, statement! <laughs> how how could a company who has access to Chat GPT and has <laughs> clearly has no problem with using AI not translate their books into other languages? What a call out! <laughs> you, you just got to man. Chat GPT is their homie. Deep L and Google Translate aren't their homies. They're just not that tight, you know. <laughs> like, dude, Chat GPT speaks Java. <laughs> you can't yeah. tell me it can't translate into Portuguese. Damn, it can speak Java. Wow. Oh yeah, it, it speaks like coding languages, regular languages, dude. You just throw a language in that thing, and it'll give you a good translation. That's crazy. Or approximate, oh, approximate. I'm, I'm not maybe. promising. That's crazy. But can it be Goku? <laughs> Can it, Ooh. Be can it be Goku? Though? You know what? In a debate. In a debate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! In a debate. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was. Ah, uh, dude, it's been a rough week for the nerd community. Rest in peace, Akira Toriyama. You know, yeah, actually, speaking seriously about it, like, like I told you earlier, I don't know if it was recording, but I told you earlier that. I'm personally not affected by this news so much because from the very beginning, I already spoke English, was fluent in it. I made my content in English from the beginning. I started playing D&D &D with my friends in English since they also speak mm -hmm. English. So mm -hmm. this doesn't do anything for me. But speaking about it seriously, like, yeah, like I just mentioned that like the language barrier is the one thing preventing you, the rest of Brazilian fans from really interacting with that wider mm -hmm. internet in a more like deep manner like I like to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like a lot, a lot of D and D fans, sadly, just don't speak the language, and they do, they, mm -hmm. they do, they make do with what they have, you know. And this is pretty much just saying, <laughs> just putting a big middle finger to everyone there who wants to play the game and likes the game. And believe it or not, Ooh, there is a whole really group is. fully comprised only of Portuguese speaking people. That's a big fuck you to all of them, you know. Yeah, honestly, but it, this is also an opportunity. Because mm -hmm. because uh, you could effectively be the hero yeah. that <laughs> the, the, the Portuguese speakers of the world need. Oh my oh my God. God. I'm gonna be the least not of, of Brazilian DND. <laughs> <laughs> you hold the power. Oh I got the, the voice. Portuguese TTRPG Jesus. I'm just saying. Oh my God. <laughs> gotta be Marvel Jesus, but for DND. <laughs> Oh exactly yeah, not just think... bringing over D, &D but oh, he's yeah. got homebrews too and you know they're just kind of like sprinkled the, over the top i don't think i can be the deadpool of D, &D man i don't think i can do it <laughs> i just don't got that dog in me man <laughs> not that dog not that one uh the, the <laughs> trick is to get just a little bit of money and outsource it to someone who does dude, does have the dog <laughs> so then so then you'll have the dog but you'll also Damn. hold the leash money I, I wish I knew what I looked like. I wish I knew Money, what I'm in college. Like. People have told me it's green, you know? People, I have heard tales of it being green and having pictures of ah. people in it. Damn. People tell me it doesn't grow on trees. I hope I can, I hope I can meet money one day. I bet they're uh, real. Maybe nice. one day. God damn. So we, uh, we talked a little bit about <laughs> Ah, yes. Oh, yeah. So, Capcom Monster Hunter did the RPG, right? Something like that? Well, uh, almost. More so I got like... some news from Dicebreaker. Monster Hunter World board game maker is going to publish the D&D uh, &D, uh, Alternative Tales of Valiant starter set. So Whoa. new D&D &D starter set from nice. the people that brought you Monster Hunter World's uh, uh, board game maker so it is an actual 5e supplement that's awesome what the fuck yeah it's a it's a full-on thing and no, like really ha one. having an alternative starter set that's great for like uh getting people that are kind of like new to the game but you don't want to hand them uh that's the minds of Vandelver. yeah that is interesting it, it reminds me, me of stuff like level up a5e don't know if you guys heard of it like advanced 5e 
which is like a group of ah. people that made pretty much like their own their own one D, if you will right their own refined yeah that, that sounds about right because it's kind of like a based off of how like older older editions are like okay we got dungeons and dragons and then there's advanced dungeons yeah. and dragons yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure they got inspiration from that terminology yeah yeah that's gotta be it i also it also reminds me of like i think it was cobalt press like I, i'm not sure if mm. it was i don't know i'm probably confusing you with project black flag which was gonna be its own ttrpg right uh i think it, that's also under the umbrella of cobalt press like uh the project yeah, black yeah. flag because yeah. like uh I, that also just kind of like seem from what I've read of it, it seems to be in the same breath as, as how 3.5 spawned Pathfinder yeah, first edition. Yeah. yeah. And, it's its own thing. I, I, I remember yeah. I remember it as like, oh, we're gonna do our own little revision of 5e as well. But remembering back, it, it it's not it's actually its own like sequel, spiritual successor to 5e, changing what they think needs changing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, fuck you, fuck you, what see? We're gonna make our own D D with blackjack and hookers. That that is a trend nowadays, man. Ever since twenty twenty two, ever since that January, that fateful January, the trend is that, fuck you what yeah. we're gonna make our own D D. Exactly. And uh, we've been around uh, talking about it ever since. With blackjack and hookers and, and that's the thing with like homebrew creators. Seven sided Yeah. They have the power to do it themselves and they see it as a mm. Yeah. Oh absolutely. yeah. Cause, it's not because they can't make money stuff. off guys like us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now we will make money off you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the revenge. Yeah. It's not completely accessible to anyone to just go and make a Kickstarter, but it sure as hell is the dream for any home brewer, man. Yeah. It's like the top. Uh, I've goal, had right? some Kickstarter ideas. I just uh haven't implemented them because that's that's a big project to undertake. I got a lot of things on my the plate. Thing with <laughs> but if, stars, right? It's because but, is that yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, go ahead. Like I, I got something, but I can hold on to that. Okay, okay. The thing with D and D Kickstarters is that, like specifically the D and D Kickstarters, is like you don't see many people wanting to do like a Kickstarter that's not gonna have anything physical in it. Right. Yeah. Usually you want to have physical mm. products. And that's what makes it the hardest part. It's like mm-hmm. to do all the process of, you know, I'm gonna have to talk with this, you know, transporter, this company, this company, gonna have to have a team, gonna have to have a marketing team. You need a team. Mm-hmm. You can't do it like with a single person. I like everyone, everyone who did a big Kickstarter recently, Monkey DM, Aventris, D D shorts, they have a team of people. It's not just yeah. them. They may be the like yeah. the the face, like just like the face of the party, but there's always a party behind the face of the party. Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely a team operation yeah. there. I mean, like yeah. when uh, Dingo and Felix put together their whole Fool's Gold stuff Kickstarter, yeah. like yeah. that's a whole thing that takes a whole team. And it was more than just like simply Felix converting everything from three, five to fifth edition that he had worked on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. The thing that not a lot of people don't immediately realize is like, in order to do like a big successful Kickstarter, you have to spend money first. Facts. Yeah. It's not just you do the Kickstarter, you get money. You have to spend money. You have to have like a, a network. You already have to be mm-hmm. like, how would I say, establish it enough to be able to get a thing, to be able to do a network, to be able to spend the money. It's a whole structure. You have a, you gotta have a structure in place to even get to the point of doing a Kickstarter. And if you try doing it without that structure, chances are it's not gonna be as big or as successful or even you know happen at all. Mm-hmm. That's, that's yeah, that. like you know, not everyone can be like Amethyst Dragon, where he's just like, I'm gonna write a 500 yeah. plus page book, <laughs> and it's gonna be really big, really thick, and yeah. I'll hire someone to do a little bit of art here and there. But for the most part, it's all me, and just you know, like the hiring that, party, that the man, hiring party, yeah. they fought it for. I don't got money, man. I want to meet the guy named Money. Pretty sure that. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, like uh, that dude goes hard on his stuff. That's crazy. I'm just, like I was uh, saying a little bit earlier. All different like, kind of dedication. It, it really so is. So much time. So, so much time you got to put into this stuff. It's crazy. And there is still the hey. chance of it not happening at all. You know, that's the... Oh. Well, 
maybe we can utilize like I get like a good we get lots of uh, homebrew creators on the show mm-hmm. like and yeah, a lot of people join the nerd militia server uh, maybe we could easily like if we just like get the right members that are motivated enough like hey we maybe you can't do it alone but what mm-hmm. if we do it together huh uh, yeah, I'm motivated I think, oh, I think even just doing the networking is already like a great thing. Yeah. It's already a great asset, if you will. Great yeah, absolutely. Great, great asset. It's amazing what people know just off of like little conversations we have with people. Because mm-hmm. you, you'd never know, honestly. I mean, I can say I can speak for myself. I don't think I can speak for anyone else. But speaking for myself, I'm always down for doing stuff. You know, collaborations, content. Like the funny thing is that I, 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 I'm sure you guys have seen like some of my work before. I like to be like this yeah. perfectionist motherfucker. I like to make my brews all pretty and with a different design for each of them that matches the theming of the brew. I like to do it like, I like to be a fucking show off, you know? <laughs> so it takes time. It takes time and effort. This, like, is, this is true. Have the right mindset, you know? <laughs> so because it takes time, I like, I have like about 50 or 60 finished fucking brews when it comes to text. They're finished. They're there. Oh, Everything's damn. there. And I just, I just, it's just a backlog, you know, just like a waiting coup. Of <laughs> what am I going to actually do the document for and post it on the internet next? You know? Mm. And I'm like, okay, I have like dozens upon dozens of stuff that I could just do the document and post. Which one am I going to do now? Oh, oops. New idea just came. Oops. New meme. I want to translate. <laughs> it just never ends. It's a never ending backlog, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like that's where Amethyst Dragon kind of ended up becoming the oh. man of over 1700 homebrews. Like he starts one idea and then another one uh, comes in. And before you know it, he's got a, a 500 page thick book and a backlog of stuff that's not going yeah. in the book. Like, oh, my God, I, I have such a fear that like, oh, my God, I wrote so much cool stuff that I just haven't posted yet and no one has seen it. I hope I actually get to post it someday i hope it just does get, it doesn't just get you know forgotten on my files or something but it's so much stuff you mm. know and so much little time oh, to I do feel it like that. i want to do yeah like i i feel that on a spiritual level because like <laughs> that's why we that's why we started the nerd militia on the whole it's just like oh. i i have an, a deep in i have a deep fear that if i don't do my creative stuff then all these ideas that I've been jotting down over the years, they're just going to drift and fizzle yeah. away. And like those ideas die with me uh, never getting shared. And uh, if they die with me, like I don't get the satisfaction of, of sharing those with people because desperately as a creative type and a nerd, I want other people to be like, hey, uh, what about this thing? Yeah. That's cool, right? Yeah. You know, that's exactly why I do you know, the segment that I do. I love yes. Hmm. I'm always like, hey, check this out. This is cool. Like, there you go. Yeah. And I love like the connections and like being able to learn more about mythology, you know, religion, culture. Yeah. That's like that's my fucking job. Yeah. <laughs> now you got it right on, man. You got it right on. Like the sharing aspect is especially from someone who's a hobbyist like me, I'm not gaining any money from this. Mm. It's a hobby. I just like to do it. I have a coffee. I'm planning on making a Patreon because I've been incentivized to do so, but Mm -hmm. I'm not getting any money from this, you know? Sometimes I get a commission, but it's like they're paying for my service, right? Sometimes I get a commission, but it's not nearly enough to be called like an income source. So it's pretty much a hobby. And as a hobby, like what, what, what am I doing this for? Because I want to share, because I want people to use it, because... Like the feeling you get when someone goes, hey, I used this stat block you created in a one shot with my kids and they loved it. <laughs> Bro, hearing that stuff is just amazing, you know? That is the reason why you do it, right? That's exactly why we do anything that we do because, like, we want to, like, just all these little I- babies of ideas, like, <laughs> all our ideas are our babies. <laughs> and and you, want, you want to see them just go out into the world and, like, you grow and become something and then like uh, you yeah. know they interact and then people are like hey 
I really appreciate this thing. Yeah. This one thing. Like it made my day a yeah. little bit better. I I like to think that, you know, everyone what, what you know, what are the kinds of dreams, right? What are the kinds of dreams that people have? I want to be famous. I want to be rich. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to do this. Yeah, I want to accomplish yeah. this. I want to get into high position. In a way, every single big dream that anyone has ever had has one thing in common. They want to influence the world around them in some way, right? Not necessarily leave behind. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why, like yeah. why do you want to leave behind something for when you're not here? Yeah. That The only thing that actually matters about that is because while you're still alive, you get the satisfaction, the feeling of mm. thinking to yourself, even when I'm not here, people are going to remember me or remember something I made. Mm. It's all yeah. about feeling that you made an influence on stuff around you, right? And even if it's small, when we do stuff like that, when creative people create something, put it out there, and other people react to it, like you're feeling that influence, even if it's a really small scale, you know? You get mm -hmm. the feeling, the mm -hmm. satisfaction of knowing that somewhere out there in the other side of the planet, someone used something that I wrote, that I edited, that I made the Photoshop document, that I made a homebrew document, that I posted on Reddit, that I wrote the title. Someone eventually saw that, took it and used it and had fun with it. You know? That idea, that visualization in my mind that, oh, there are kids playing with my stuff in, on their table. That's it. You know, Just that yeah. knowing is not something I imagine. It's something that happened. You know? Just that for me, is it's enough. You know? It's why I keep doing it. Oh, as long as I keep having time to do it, right? <laughs> a lot of people it's try really to make it into a job in order to keep doing it, right? And that's the reason why a lot of people try to make it into a job. Like, mm -hmm. oh, if I yeah. can do an actual source of income and make it into my, you know, my bread and butter, if I can live off of making homebrew content or TTRPG third-party content, that means I mm -hmm. keep doing it, right? Because if they don't do that, right. they will most likely have to stop because real life happens, you know? Yeah, also nice and today. really, it, it hurts to stop that kind of stuff. It's like exactly. every time a DM has to put a campaign on indefinite hiatus wow. because l their personal life has gotten in the way, and then like, well, oh, yeah. that creative train has been stopped, mm -hmm. and we can get it like, back. Mm -hmm. the, the ideas die with it, and it's the just, real BBG was always real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it really <laughs> is, honestly, and like. Honest, not, what you said, I couldn't resonate with that possibly more than I do now because all I've, for me, all I've wanted to do is be like some kind of media producer because there's just too many ideas floating around. Gotta get them out there. Gotta do something with them, right? Exactly. Gotta make them not be, just be ideas. Right? Mm -hmm. I gotta turn them into something that is not just an idea floating around in my head. I got it. One in some aspect wants to create like i feel like human nature is to to like want to make something and to want to like yeah you know, like you were just saying like just mm. kind of like affect the world around yeah us. that's all we're trying to do with this podcast and you know if, what yeah. you're trying to do with your creations and stuff and i love it it's so if nice. not I, if not if not yeah. create they want to accomplish something, right? Yeah. Like a lot of people accomplishing something is a way of influencing, I don't know, maybe their own lives, not necessarily everything around them, mm -hmm. so, but it is a way of influencing their lives. For example, my friends a lot, that play D&D play with me, a lot of them aren't like creatively inclined like I am, but they mm -hmm. are very much like power gamers. They love the feeling of, I completed this game. I did a platinum on this game. I did this speed run yeah. challenge. They're not creating, but they're accomplishing stuff that, that yeah, matters absolutely. to them. You know, that matters to them. Serotonin. Yeah. Oh, and man. honestly, just like when you're <laughs> when you're in a game, that's a shared experience. That's a shared adventure. There's nothing more interesting than the just the experience of someone that is a, remembering a game that they were in, yeah. and they will vividly remember everything mm. that happened in the game in a scenario. And describe it to you as if they were actually there. And that's just a magical moment. Living vicariously, man. Yeah, that's what so do you mean I wasn't part of the Dragon's Dogma <laughs> game? What do you mean I wasn't part of that, that part of those, those characters? I was there, man. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, it's just like, uh, I've watched nations fall and slay dragons. I was yeah. there. I wasn't playing the game. I was there, man. 
What do you mean? Yeah, not... we are the game. Like, Daddy. what do you mean I'm not the herald of Untrusted? What? I need a blanket. Like Dragon, Age. Dragon Age. Dragon Age was crazy, man. Such a good franchise. I tried it once. I didn't get too far into it because oh. I have commitment issues. <laughs> <laughs> At least you are self-aware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dragon Age Origins specifically is one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. Uh, like, that was the that was the one that I tried. Oh, I, I remember really liking it, but like uh, like you said, life gets in the way, and it's just like yeah, I, no, I didn't I keep took, on I took it. A few months to finish it. Like the fact that the game got me hooked straight for months is a testament in itself, you know. Oh, absolutely! Like I, I feel the, that way about Baldur's most, Gate. Baldur's Gate, nice. What was the game you most remember fondly about Sam? Sorry, what was that? Couldn't really hear you. Oh, the game you most remember fondly about? Oh man, I, I was always a big like Skyrim, Monster mm. Hunter, like uh, mm. like Fallout, you know, that kind of era of stuff. Fallout New Vegas. Uh, Fallout Three and Fallout Four mostly. Um, what's another one? I was always very, very big with like, like Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> that comes to mind. Like, oh, yeah. I love stuff like that. Uh, my wife loves that stuff. Oh, I mean, that was yeah. always something that like me and my dad played a lot together. And Did you know cool. that Ratchet and Clank 3 Up Your Arsenal was the first video game, like console video game I ever played? Are you serious? That's awesome. That's yeah. a good one, too. I think mm. it was probably a big part of why I eventually grew to love video games and really? pop culture as a whole, because the first real video game experience I had on my own console was that game. And what, what can be said about that game, man? What cannot be said about that game? What a video honestly. game as video game, man. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> Hell, what the fuck oh my god, and another one that comes to mind, fucking like God of War and uh, Dante's Inferno, you know? I didn't play one and two. I played Dante's Inferno. That was so good. I oh, didn't play man. one and two, but I played three. Like, I remember that it, it was the flagship of the PlayStation 3's launch. Yeah. Bro. Yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. God of War 3 was such a like a hype injection onto your veins. Like you start the game and okay, I know that it's the third one, so I know that I've missed yeah. some story. Okay, yeah, I yeah. missed the first two games. I am aware of that. And but even so, even even if you're aware, like as someone who had never interacted with anything God of War before, and you're just getting your first PlayStation 3 and come to that game and you're like, okay, I know I missed some stuff. Let's see what the fuck right. is. Oh my god, you know, the game just Starts full throttle, it keeps going full throttle, it goes beyond full throttle. And <laughs> That's God of War. It's, yeah, just, it's, a, it's like a Jason Statham movie, it just doesn't stop right until the end, man. That shit yeah, that's crazy. straight how the entire series goes. Like, I played Maybe. some, but Maybe. mostly I've just watched other people play because, like, <laughs> you're with your friends and you, you always got like that one buddy that's like ridiculously into God of War. I mean, can't blame him. God of War 3 is my gem, man. I, that, that is a hype injection. I love that game. Love <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. I'd imagine there's a lot to learn from uh, God of War as like as a DM. Like uh, the, mm. One of the er first campaigns that I ran as a DM, I didn't know uh, any traditional D&D pantheons. So I'm like, fuck it. We're going Greek, guys. <laughs> Greek pantheon. Nice. All way. And uh, <laughs> if you want to be the party paladin and swear yourself to Dionysus, go right ahead. I feel like this is a pretty good transition for me to get into the monster here. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if your players are also not familiar with it, you know. If they're all, like, new to D&D, &D, that, that can work extremely well, I think. You know? Oh, Co absolutely. Control, like uh, media they're already familiar with, you know? Yeah, and, and maybe if you have, like, a player that's a Percy Jackson fan, then they'll... Oh, ooh, yeah, true, right? true. Just take all the, the franchises that do Greek, that adapt Greek mythology and just mix it all together. Do a little Fortnite, oh, if you will. Yeah, throw it all in the blender, mix it up, see what happens. Like for <laughs> me, my name is Greek. So it's just like, okay, by, by you know, oh, the yeah. nature of it, I have to True. know some Greek stuff. I Like if you... If your name is Orion and you can't shoot a bow and you don't yeah. know anything about <laughs> Greek mythology, 
Uh, your, sorry, man. The council won't accept. Honor bound duty. Like, if you don't know Greek yeah. stuff, your name is revoked. <laughs> you are no longer yeah. allowed to use the name Aria. It's like the vegan police. <laughs> exactly. The Greek police. Exactly. I'm sure there's lots of names out there like that. You mm. know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, let's I see. thought you were going to say, I'm I, sure I, there's I, lots of Greek police out there. <laughs> Greek police. <laughs> uh, I, I can only ever think of this uh, one uh, Greek security guard I knew, and oh. like this one single quote that from him that resonates in my mind, where he's oh. just like, "Hey, you, you sound like you have big bowls in your mouth," <laughs> and he just. <laughs> I don't yeah, think he, he was a to... shit. He Sorry. was shit talking this one kid, and it was hilarious. I, I don't think I even want to know the context of that one. I think it's funnier if I don't know the context. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead the context and, uh, is underwhelming, here, but the, <laughs> but the uh, viciousness of his why insults it was better without are content. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we do actually have some segments here that we can get through. <laughs> oh, yeah. Before we get into some, segments, some I forgot kind of to different. answer your question, Sam. Oh, you yeah. Asked me, you had asked me... What is my favorite type of homebrew to make, right? Oh man, that was like knowing that I yeah yeah I mean, <laughs> knowing oh, that we I'm get so fan, lost on this show. <laughs> I mean, I think it's part of every podcast, right? Let us be real. yeah, honestly, we should yeah. be vibing. I mean, you ask, I think yeah, knowing that I'm an avid fan of pop culture, what are my favorite types of brews to make? Like, it's an interesting question because. I don't, I, I don't know if you guys are aware, but one of the things that I'm probably more so well known for as a brewer is because I, I, do, I do a lot of like reference brews. For example, mm -hmm. the, the last really big one that popped off in terms of numbers on UA was my little company Warlock, right? Oh, little yeah. page from the company. Ooh. It's literally like you get a functioning game of little company by playing that subclass pretty much. So it's the stuff I like to do, I, right? I, I think I saw that once, but didn't get like too into reading it because, like, it's, uh, a, big one. I, it's a big one. yeah. Because like, I, I can only share like so much it's in our homebrew segment on this yeah, show. Yeah, and, yeah absolutely. Like, like, it's a, it's a real shame. Class, you know? <laughs> some of my subclasses sometimes people go like, "Oh, this just looks like a full class," and I'm like, "Right, it's not, it's not." But I get, I get what you're saying. Like ten pages on a subclass, I get it. I get what you mean. Yeah, but like. I don't know if I would say those are necessarily my favorite types of brews to make. Mm -hmm. Because I think my answer would be, what is my favorite type of brew to make? Whatever is on my mind at the moment. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. like my favorite type of brew to make is the, the thing that is obsessed in my mind at the moment. So if I like, oh yeah. shit, Tekken yeah. 8 just launched. Oh my God, that was so cool. Oh my God, they used the team on this cutscene, the, the Jin Kazama's team from Tekken 3. They made a remix of it. Oh my God, that's so cool. You know, oh shit. Yeah, yeah. Turns out I just did a whole set a whole set of character feats that are based on Tekken. There you go. Nice. Posted on UA, you know, that happens. Like, oh yeah, I got that, you know, dozen 60 brew backlog of them ready to go. Whoops, that's the thing I'm obsessed with right now. There you go. It goes for <laughs> It just happened. Where will you be when I inspiration that's strikes? Very similar for you know many creators, they just kind of have to be able to take that spur of the moment inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember yeah. the Shadow Wizard money game meme was going around. I saw. Oh my god! You know, I left my ass. I remember that. I then because I saw that one video, like three or four months. Wait, that's one of your homebrews that we we brought in on the show. That one, oh, that was it. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. It was one of the ones. It was escaping you which one of your brews we brought on and that was the one. The that's Shadow right. Wizard. Yeah. I think I did talk about that. I think that's the so guests funny. you had at the time were like, yo, this one's cool because it touches on criminality. And I was watching, I was like, wait, does it? <laughs> 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 and it kind of did. It bit. was funny because it was not something I intended, but completely made sense with the way he interpreted yeah. but like yeah like I, I remember i watched the video i laughed my ass off i'm like huh that's a funny meme and then i watched four more videos and i kept laughing my ass off and just huh this is wizards wizards yeah. are a thing that exists in dnd huh mm. oh shit the mechanics are already popping into my mind oh shit i did the subclass oh well might as well post it and there you go oh yeah 500 upvotes because yeah. people loved it that's awesome. <laughs> it, just, it just happens sometimes you know like I just, just, it, it really does take the meme and how how would I translate this meme into like a character option? And right. that question just bursts it. 
from that question alone, the whole thing is just birthed. You know, it, it's sometimes like it's what I like to say when inspiration strikes, it's like it's fast. It's a fast process. You know, I, I am yeah. privileged enough, blessed enough to be able to capitalize on these inspiration moments mm -hmm. to like, go on the my Word document and just, you know, write it all down before I, before it goes away, like you said, right? Yeah. Mm. I love that. Yeah, pretty much. That. I think that's my answer. Like, what is my favorite type of brew to do? Whatever I'm obsessed with at the moment. Yeah. If it's a reference, <laughs> if it's a completely new idea that came into my mind, you know, whatever it is, if I'm if I it's if kind I'm of way, with uh, it right now, that's my favorite thing. Too. Yeah. That's oh, really absolutely. funny because, like, dating an artist too. Like, I see oh. that a lot. Um, where she just kind of uh, she'll just kind of take whatever inspires her and run with it in the moment. Maybe she'll make a bunch of like the same kind of theme and she'll flip between them. Like it's always nice to see like the artistic process. And I do find like homebrew creators to be artists. Oh, absolutely. Know? Yeah. Like there are a lot of people that also do their, their own art for their brews. Right. Yeah. But even if you don't oh, make absolutely. your own artwork, yeah. like visual artwork for your brews, yeah. you can use AI, you know? Yeah. 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 Even in I, I, Controversial take, sorry, but even I, AI yeah. has some work to it, you know? It, yeah. It, like, so you yeah. never use AI before. You have to learn how to do prompts. You have to keep trying a lot of different combinations. I am aware that it's not just you click a button and the magic happens and there you go. Right. You know? So, like, but regardless of how you do the artwork, for example, I, what I do is like I spend hours upon hours searching for the right just the right artwork to use sometimes i take multiple artworks extract a different piece of each of those artworks and mix them to get into a new composition which essentially becomes a new image that didn't exist before i eventually right. learned that that's called photo bashing so i i, I can say that now. <laughs> I'm a, I'm I know that. Photo bashing, right so that's what i always do learn something new every day <laughs> what yeah, Learn something new every day. I didn't know that. exactly. I didn't know there was a term for it, but it sure as hell is useful to know that there's a specific term I can just drop. You know, any people know what I mean. But like, that's what I, what I do in my case. But regardless of how you do your artwork, people gotta remember that, bro. What is homebrew? Even for a shit designer, even if for yeah. a shit at balance, even if you don't give a fuck, if your shit is the most overpowered, if you make a subclass and it is usable, and especially so if it is minimally balanced. Creative writing, mm -hmm. game design, knowledge of grammar, grammar Absolutely. knowledge of syntaxes, right? right? Diagram, it helps a lot. Like, composition. All of those are artistic skills that you're employing to make the homebrew document. And if you use homebrew like I do, you also got to know programming, the basic programming, right. because that shit is CSS. <laughs> so true. Yeah, a little CSS, a little HTML. And yeah. that's actually something I got uh, some help out of ChatGPT for because oh. I taught myself HTML and CSS years ago. But like teaching yourself something and not keeping up with it, <laughs> you get rusty real fucking yeah. quick. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah. okay, uh, here, uh, uh, help me format this into HTML, CSS. Okay, cool, cool. Copy, paste, and then use what knowledge I do have to just kind of, okay, let me rearrange that, move that right there. Mm -hmm. um, that's I can't not imagine how it can be so helpful for a lot out. of people. Yeah. Like, I personally don't want to use it. I don't want to become, like, even minimally dependent on it. But I can mm. absolutely imagine how helpful it must be, how practical it must be for people who don't have, like, this luxury yeah. that I have to be able to just brute force my way through making it all myself. <laughs> I, I yeah, feel that not it's one of those things where I, yeah, I feel like for me, it's like if I use GPT, it's like I'm gonna brain dump any uh, <laughs> all of it right into it. it's yeah. like just oh, <laughs> right into it, and then I, then I just and then I put all of that in quotes, and then then I just uh, type in or I'll just tell it to organize the information using the criteria that yeah. I determine, and it's like boom. Organized. Oh, so you just Tony Stark. Hey Jarvis, do this completely impossible thing for me. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, there you go, Mister. <laughs> you yeah. can now have time travel. Yeah, just, oh, thank you, Jarvis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just just take my mind brain goop uh, and just uh, can do turn this. Like uh, this. Uh, yeah, just just and take this out, that and absolutely make means it workable. You're the author. That absolutely means yeah. it, right? Avengers Endgame. Uh, I would and say so. 
Avengers Endgame. <laughs> you now have time travel. Amazing. Who? Man, Sam, a... you had a monster. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, today, you know, to kind of match the theme of what I've been talking about lately, you know, we talked about the gin, talked about the uh, the free, you know. Now I'm going to talk about the Dow. <laughs> ah, there is a trend here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been going through them a little bit. I find them pretty interesting. Wait, you said you're going to talk about the dad, the father. The Dow. Oh, I was like, damn, the worst scripted of them all. The dad. Yeah. Mysterious <laughs> disappearing randomly. He actually came back with the milk, but it was cursed milk. Right, so oh! standing at about eight to My 11. My kids feet. joke about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so standing about eight to 11 feet tall, stocky, and muscular. The Dow first appeared in Dragon Number Sixty Six in an article by Gary Gygax, Ooh. alongside the Marid and the John. Muscular. Do, do do you got like some like an image or a reading from a text? I want to look at it as well. Yeah. Um, Orion should be able to put up some images. Yeah. I want to I want to look at whatever you're looking right now. Yeah, yeah. I write yeah. Uh, my own like notes page, but uh, I do put some pictures on it. <laughs> Show me the cursed knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Sure, Ryan will put some up in a moment. Give me so, the vision. Just, just the monsters know what they're doing, book states. The four elements of air, earth, fire, and water mm -hmm. originated with the Greeks. But somewhere along the line, some D&D writer must have read that jinn and Arab myth were supernatural beings of air and the freaks were supernatural beings of fire, decided that there had to be corresponding entities of water and earth too, and shoehorned Marids mm -hmm. into the genies of water role, Maybe because of the syllable mar means sea in Latin. In mm. Arabic, however, marid means defiant or rebellious. And it's used to describe all sorts of troublemaking creatures, including not only certain genies, but demons and giants. As well. mm. And to anyone yeah. who has uh, listened to a previous episode where I talk about the Ifrits, they were especially, you know, rebellious and defiant, you know, as is the nature of fire. Oh, it's an elemental. Mm. Yes, so the yeah, Dow... I, I did put a little thing in the chat there. Yeah, cool. Uh, so the Dow are the Earth uh, plane equivalent of the Free. I see. Yeah. So I want to talk a little so, bit so about... So they're, like, they're a type Daoism. of jinn. They're Earth yeah. jinn. Right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Taoism here to kind of give you a little bit of a background. All right. yeah, I see it. Yeah. So the Dow is low and receiving as a valley soft and life-giving as water and it is the mysterious female the source of all life the mother of the ten thousand things human beings should become weak and yielding as water that overcomes the hard and the strong as always and always take the low ground they should develop their male and female size but prefer femininity feed on the mother and find within themselves the well that never runs dry Tao is also the axis the ridge pole the pivot and the empty center of the hub the sage is the useless tree or the gourd too long, too large to be fashioned into implements. A frequent metaphor for the working of the Tao is the incommutable ability to be skillful at a craft. Skilled artisans do not ponder their actions, but in union with the Tao of their subjects, they do their work reflexively and without conscious intent. And I find this super interesting considering mm -hmm. everything we just talked <laughs> about. It, it just... It seems like they are the dwarves of of Jin. That's a, a good way to put it, and it's it's a good way to like represent the like Earth nature, you know. Yeah, I like it. And I, and I, and I always bit, think of dwarves as just uh, the, these craftsmen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like oh yeah, and that's the thing you're. I'm going to talk about here in a minute. The Dao, especially our master craftsmen. Mm. You know? <laughs> ah, see. Yeah. It all comes together. You know, when I think bit. of dwarven culture, the first thing that comes to mind, believe it or not, is the earthbenders from the original Avatar. You know? Honestly, yeah. And what's yeah, really you know funny what? I, about I feel that, that. <clears throat> the, the earth plane, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, um, but the earth plane is like, people do go there because it's a huge like mining opportunity mm -hmm. right but it's extremely dangerous there's no air there's no oh, light you know what i mean cool. like that that's but a, yeah people who who 
go to the elemental planes and stuff like that, they go to the earth plane for the mining. That's so is- cool. I never thought about mm-hmm. that because it's a completely like it, it's a world building reason for yeah. why like any being would be in that place because usually you mm-hmm. see a lot of like, oh, the elemental plane of fire where it comes mm. dragon BBGs and elemental BBGs and all kinds of BBGs. Right. Like, okay, it's just a big plane of nothing but fire. No one would want to go there. The only thing that comes right. from there is- yeah, the off, city of brass you know, with the you. Freaks, you know? But then now you're saying, no, there are the other elemental planes. You have completely like mm-hmm. logical reasons for people to want to go into that yeah. material. Like, Oh shit! Mind blown. Like, um, imagine the kind of things and materials yeah. and items you could find yeah. in that. Like, uh, and now I imagine can any try dwarf. And create a reason for why people want to go into the elemental plane of fire in the first place. Yeah, maybe there's some materials yeah. there. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to talk yeah. a little bit about Taoism here. There's a kind of a relation to Taoism. Mm-hmm. So in Taoism, related traditions and other Chinese religions and sects who incorporate it into their worldviews. Believe the Tao or the Tao belief is the natural way of the universe, whose character one's intuition must discern to realize the potential for individual wisdom, as conceived in the context of East Asian philosophy, religion, and related traditions. This seeing of life cannot be grasped of the concept, rather it is seen through actual living experience of one's everyday, everyday being. His name derives from a Chinese character with meanings including way, path, road, and sometimes doctrine or principle. In the Tao Te Ching, which I believe is a book, Lao Zi explains that the Tao is not a name for a thing, but the underlying nature, natural order of the universe, whose ultimate essence is difficult to circumscribe because it is non-conceptual, yet evident in one's being of aliveness. <laughs> I love this. The Tao I actually is have a copy of that. On, on, I actually really? have a copy of that on my bookshelf. Awesome. <laughs> The Tao is eternally nameless and should be distinguished from the countless named things that are considered to be its manifestations. The reality of life for the descriptions of. Interesting. I I love that. Eternally nameless. And I do believe that the Tao and the cultures of the earth plane do kind of hold this philosophy. It's kind of interesting how it's a complete counterpart to stuff like demons and devils and their true yeah. name yeah. But what's really interesting is the Tao and things from the earth plane are always neutral evil neutral evil really yeah huh huh specifically maybe, maybe there's some differences Why? but the Tao especially are neutral evil i mean the fact I, I that it's unexpected it's, makes uh, it interesting in my opinion yeah i believe it's yeah. because they are like of the merchant variety and they deal with a lot of materials uh, Materialism. No, that, no, that's what it they're is. evil by nature. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically like that. So, and Nothing another reason I'm going to get into it. here in a minute <laughs> of why they're evil. Into the Forgotten Realms lore, the Tao were generally evil beings that saw nothing wrong in enslaving others, despite greedily <laughs> fearing the loss of their own freedom <laughs> oh, and despising boy. whoever would imprison them. Oh, However, boy. they would almost always return acts of fairness and kindness, thus the neutralness. So Tao took great pride in things that were well made and plots that were well planned out. Of all the genie races, the Tao were considered to be the most industrious. They spent much of their time in the pursuit of mining, shaping, and digging, and it was these pursuits that made slavery so common in their society. You know, as we've said before on this show, the children yearn for the mines. I mean... The the, the Tao (laughs) firmly (laughs) believe this. Look, if they're old enough to work, they're old enough to get the fucking job done, man. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that'd be a great plot hook for a campaign, though. Like a oh, yeah? like a Tao slaver, uh, it comes to the material plane to start uh-huh. like uh, uh, kidnapping villages, and that's and the that they, they do that. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, oh, man, it's so interesting. You get like a series of villages disappearing overnight, and yeah. all that's and there's just like little left, but like uh, some gemstone remains. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because the genies literally carved out an empire from the elemental plane of Earth called the Great Dismal Delve, based strongly on slave labor. They were ruled from their capital city of the Sevenfold Maze Work by their great Khan, Kabril al Asara al Zalazil. <laughs> I almost said it without fucking up. That's probably <laughs> something straight out of Dune. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, when I did the free one, it, it was pretty much what you would expect. It was kind of like that, but worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, yeah, I like the progress. 
Beyond the elemental plane of Earth, the Tao can be found living in great numbers on the quasi-elemental plane of dust, quasi-elemental plane of the minerals, plane of magma, and mm. the plane of ooze. Ooh. Plane of so, ooze? Oh my Yeah, the para Yeah, that's legit, ooze. man. Like it seems like something out of adventure time, but it's plane canon ooze, to D D. The end of love jar. It. <laughs> Every single use is like, <laughs> forget, forget what I just said, my dirty mind. <laughs> So beyond those I mean, planes, the Tao can be found roaming with magical protection fuck, across I'm all of the inner planes. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> they get they magically protected, you know? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Damn. <laughs> I, my mind is still stuck on the mineral plane. Oh, and I, oh, like uh, I'm thinking like Futurama, like the fucking Borax kid, just That's having like an entire uh, area of Borax people. Dude, That's I can really imagine funny. like all kinds of like probably crystal creatures and uh, yeah, <laughs> things made out of like iron or whatever. That's fucking crazy. I love things made out of iron. I love metallic. <laughs> yeah. So they they are mm. known to you know roam around the inner planes, the astral, the ethereal, in search of things and creatures to enslave. Right. So sometimes yeah. Lone Dao could be found on the prime material plane, Straight hoping to open up new markets slaves. and supply lines God for their damn. empires. <laughs> when on that plane, they preferred to be in mountainous terrain, as it reminded them of their home plane, while mortal cities made them feel unease. Much like their home plane, some Dao ran gem mining operations on the material plane. When it came to specific locales on the material plane, they could essentially and especially be found in the wild regions of Z- Zakara. So I mean, like we were just saying, it could be a really cool plot point. You know, your party is in a mountainous region. They find a, a market or like a, a traveling merchant, you know, Dow. He has a few slaves or something. Mm. Like, see, On his way like, back into the, the earth plane. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, it's just like kind of like one thing leads to another. But one of the things that really strikes me is that there's one. Well, not one thing, but. Slavery is on that list of things that most people can agree that bad. You don't do it. That is right. evil shit. And yeah. like as soon as slavery shows up, it's like, okay, the player in my mind is, you know what? Take the murder hobo shackles off. I'm killing <laughs> this thing. And <laughs> like you're justified. It's it's yeah, actually this evil. Culture. This is what they do. Like it's just how their their lives work. This is normal to them. This is it's how not our brains are wired, by the way. This is how we are all wired, by the way. If we see something yeah. that we think is morally <laughs> evil, we feel morally justified to do evil. Mm-hmm. That's crazy, right? Like, what, what do yeah, you mean? It, I'm doing that's... evil. I'm not doing evil. I'm doing evil to the evil person. That means yeah. I'm doing good, right? That means I'm doing good. Yeah, right? Isn't yeah. that crazy? So a little yeah, bit. It, it, it makes for such a fun dynamic because, like, really a lot of players like the. There are just like some players that love gray in their uh, play settings, but yeah, other and they love like, like to question their own morals. I love it. Yeah, and this is one of those things that starts out with like it's black and white until it isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like th- I like to think that these kind of situations are pretty much okay. Now you all got to be murder hobos without feeling guilty for it. Go <laughs> have fun. No yeah. guilt. But, but then you also have to think about it because say you free these slaves, right? That's this is their lives. What are they supposed to do now? Like <laughs> uh, you have to deal with the repercussions of freeing slaves. I like know. you create an entire like underground railroad to the plane of earth, which is literally all tunnels at this point. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and you're trying to like get all these slaves out and then like where are you gonna yeah, put I mean, them? Are you just gonna, that, just gonna abandon think, them? And then you have to like, deal I, with the I think, them wanting I think them back. Freeing <laughs> them, that, you get, that will be the difference between freeing them and actually saving them. If you just yeah. you know kill their ah. captors and leave them there, you are freeing them, but you're not doing anything else besides that. If you right. actually go through the trouble of taking them with you, finding somewhere for them to be, something for them to do, helping them, you know, reestablish into a civilization, mm-hmm. that's actually saving them, right? Definitely. That's a difference yeah. there. Giving the players the option to do either one or the other, maybe a secret third option. That's a cool thing, right? That's a cool so thing that it, uh, they can do. Or I guess I a cool idea to kind of give you guys a little bit of a background description <laughs> of the plane of Earth, right? 
Excuse me, not <laughs> before I go into right. the abilities and stuff like uh, that. I, I'm already sold. You, you know. had me already. See, but this this all goes into my idea that we need to do more with these planes, man. <laughs> I mean, that's There's completely so much you know opportunity what? here. You know what, Sam? What if we dedicate like one month out of the year yeah. to just like all the planes all the time? I mean, I'm all the planes all the time. Yeah, because we do monsters on a regular basis. I think yeah. just having an entire month, just like, hey, it, it, we got planes, all the planes. <laughs> it's a yeah. monthly thing. I that mean, I've been going cool, through you know? them a little bit. Yeah, why not? That could be cool. Like, this I mean, is we're already kind of doing that this time. We're talking about, I mean, this past month, I've been talking about all the gin and genies and stuff from each of the mm. planes. Yeah, I was kind of planning kinda like to do the up. air into water ones next. Mm. But anyway... Well, the elemental plane of Earth was an infinite expanse of solid matter, pockmarked by bubbles of other elements and riddled with fissures and tunnels, created by burrowing creatures or the occasional small mining operation. Ensconced in a few of these pockets were trading outposts and rare hidden wizard fortresses. Solid does not imply stationary. The substances of the plane were constantly moving in a slow, grinding motion, hmm. punctuated by earthquakes from small temper. From small tremors to massively violent upheavals. The grind never ends. <laughs> often, often spaces were gradually filled by the relentless shifting, uh, unless action were taken to prevent it. Air could right. be found that in scattered shit. pockets, but unbreathable gases were also present. <laughs> Unprepared <laughs> travelers... You'll bring your enough. canaries. <laughs> unbreathable gases. <laughs> yeah, honestly. That's me in the bathroom right there. Because they're, they're not supposed to be, <laughs> to be there in, you know, in the plane of Earth. So unprepared travelers lucky enough to arrive in a cavern might slowly Pretty asphyxiate lucky. while the unlikely quickly suffocated by being buried alive. Other pockets of magma, water, ooze, dust, or ash were particularly dangerous for miners if they accidentally breached one of these. No light existed in the plane of Earth except for rare luminous gems buried in the crushing darkness. Travelers able to pass through stone were effectively blind unless they used magic such as a ring of x-ray vision or until their oh. eyes reached an open space where dark vision could operate ah, oh, or a source of light could be provided. Hearing was also actually enhanced while encased in earth to the point where travelers could detect any movement through the rock within a certain radius of their position. And the gravity on the plane of earth is described as being heavy. So... Yeah, because like there's mass all around you. Yeah, and I would imagine like uh, it would be heavy gravity, but the direction of it would be kind of something that would be hard to determine. Yeah, because like whatever whatever surface you're walking on, like <laughs> in in my mind, mm -hmm. you could like walk in a giant ass tunnel and walk all around the tunnel. Oh, because gravity is because yeah. exactly. gravity is like. There's just so much mass in every direction that mm -hmm. gravity would literally, you could be pulled to any surface that's walkable. Now, so let's unless take that and, and add the like, fact that we're thinking about mines, right? We're thinking yeah. about the plane of Earth being mm. just an endless tunnels. If we think of tunnels and caverns, what do we think of? Mining. Mining mm -hmm. sites, right? Yeah. So we think of dwarves, yeah. we think of mines, we think of pickaxes. Take the, no, the, the usual like fantasy mining construction site. Yeah. With uh -huh. those sort of like, um, what's the word? Like the thing that you find on amusement parks? Like, roller coasters. Uh, roller coasters. Oh, like a mining yeah, car. Yes. Yeah, so, like, like the that. mining car yeah, like, roller coasters. Take that, that kind of scenario, mm. that kind of scenery, and apply the no gravity thing to it. Oh, yes. Man. Look at this stuff. Like, it imagine. could be. You could have rails on the bottom, rails up on top, exactly. and then like a, the workers exactly. are working the sides. You could have a spiral rail that goes all throughout the single tunnel. Ooh. It would be some crazy <laughs> shit, bro. And you oh, know, that considering a lot wild. of the the creatures that probably live in this, you know, plane have things like Earth Glide, like the you know, like the Dao do. They're moving Earth through glide? the stone. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> And, you know, they, they both live within and move through the stone itself. So it's like they're not in danger of like being crushed like a person from the prime material or needing to breathe or something like that. <laughs> like, it's great. I would imagine that they'd sometimes forget about air until they're like, oh, yeah, our slaves need that. Right. Because they don't they don't there's no no air supposed to really be there. Like. I don't know. It's crazy. Mm. So it's so cool. It's kind of an overwrap of that. Now moving to the abilities and stats of the Dow. 
Are you seeing the same stat block that I linked or a different one? Um, let me see. It should be the general fifth edition. Because I just I just put DAO D and yes. on Google and it was the first one that appeared in terms Yeah, of- yeah, this one. Nice. Yeah. So okay. we have a strength of twenty three for anyone not looking. We have a dex of twelve, constitution of twenty four, intelligence of twelve, mm-hmm. wisdom of thirteen, and charisma of fourteen. And they are a CR eleven in most situations. So beyond gonna, their vast array of magical abilities, <laughs> Dow were known to fight up close with their fists and mauls. I'm going to say right now that uh, coming right out of the gate with the IRL fight score, that's a 10 <laughs> out of 10. That's a 10 out of 10. Nope. For me. No, I, I couldn't. Dude, you're talking about something that can uh, go full Danny Phantom sink into the ground and still <laughs> attack me. Yeah. No. Like 24. That's a solid rock, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, dude. Uh, I ain't punching granite. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, this is like earth. Yeah, rock, like a true the person, earth element. the thing, the creature. So I, I would expect a high con yeah. score for sure. Right. Rock so oh, absolutely. First ability here: the Dao can burrow through non-magical, unworked earth and stone. While doing so, Dao does not disturb the material it moves through. You know, Earth Glide is pretty standard, you would imagine. So next, we have Elemental Demise. If the Dao dies, its body disintegrates into crystalline powder. Even behind only equipment the Dow was wearing or carrying. Drug food is really cool. I like to imagine that that's a big time drug. <laughs> oh God! I imagine it does something. <laughs> like someone, like there's a there is a buyer in some of the realms for Dow dust. They love to snort that shit. Gin narcotics are on demand. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Gin narcotics. He's got it. <laughs> so the Dow are innate spellcasters, and it is uh, charisma. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I would. I would honestly expect if any monster is gonna have it, I would expect this one to have like Constitution spellcasting. Yeah, right. Especially honestly, innate yeah. spellcasting, right? That's so true. Or like honestly, even like a strength. But then again, <laughs> that would also mean they get a plus mm. seven plus. <laughs> Holy <their> shit! Yeah, <laughs> so, that would be ridiculous. Yeah. That would but escalate. That would... <laughs> yeah. But hey, if you want to make them more <laughs> difficult, like if your party is just slaughtering these things, then maybe that's a just the little that's the ticket right there. Dude, and imagine the quality. I imagine that the this powder would be, or like what you could mm. use it for. Enchantments will be crazy. Yeah, you could call it a real spice. So the spells that they have at will are detect evil <laughs> and good, detect magic, and stone shape. They have three days each, or three three times a day each, pass wall, move earth and tongues. Mm-hmm. One day each, conjure elemental, with it only being earth elementals, obviously. Stones, Gaseous okay, form, okay. invisibility, phantasmal killer, plane shift, and wall of stone. Damn, this shit got gaseous form? That's OP, is that? I know, right? Invisibility. That's weird. <laughs> Phantasmal killer? Oh my god! <laughs> Phantasmal killer is like I- I'm out. That's done. <laughs> done. Yep. Last but not least, we have it's sure plane footed. shift, bro. God damn! <laughs> yeah. It's one day each. By the way, I mean, one it day makes, each. It makes spell. sense with these, you know, running like slave trading operations and markets. And I find it know. funny that it has sure footed. Like that is yeah, like they. I mean, it makes like, sense for Earth people, ground? but at the same time, bro, the illustration shows it being like a <laughs> Danny Phantom as yeah, sand ghost. Like what the doesn't fuck even you really have legs. Footing? You don't got legs, bro. <laughs> gonna knock it you over. can't get no sure footed. You get no sh- better sure footed <laughs> like than that. <laughs> Like, I think it would I'm so feet. sure I the don't need legs. Sense. The ability makes sense. But they don't like how it's named. Because it's, it's like, so what funny. do you mean sure footed? Yeah. It, it's, it's it could just be like form, levitating right? or something. Yeah, like, like it's not that it's sure footed. It. It's not touching the ground. It can't touch yeah, the ground. It's not even yeah. touching the ground. It's a fucking ghost. You're gonna knock ghost. it prone. Like, uh, <laughs> call it sturdy. You know what I mean? Like yeah, sure that, footed. That is not. The X Dow that for the sweet. Sturdy. Ten out of ten cannot fight, but think they are really cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very see... seldom we get a ten out of ten would not fight. But yes. ironically this enough, is a... it is it is the one that you would live through because they would enslave you. Uh, yeah, this is true. They wouldn't kill you. They would just like that. train you up, yeah. take you to the Earth plane, and make you a miner for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh yeah, man! Imagine like a campaign which is literally like, okay, you gotta go uh, into the Earth, the 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 plane of Earth to free the people that were enslaved to become miners. You're just freeing mm-hmm. a whole lot of dwarves, bro. 
Oh my or, god. Yeah. Or just maybe to do a deep rock galactic empire. Dude, I would imagine like they especially would like to enslave dwarves. Yeah. Or what if the players yeah. are all or like a fresh batch of slaves? Oh. Oh, oh prison break. Oh, yeah. That's oh, that's, that's really a cool. good ass setting right there. Yeah, I would that's love a classic trope where like you go and maybe you meet a merchant and they happen to be like a like a Dao or an Afrit or something, you know? Yeah, having yeah. Maybe it and like be cool, free, maybe it'd be like a Madrid, but like well, the, the cool thing here is like a, it. This is the kind of setting where you get to have prison break and uh, utilize a dungeon, like classic dungeon Dude, crawl. Yeah, Bro, you you could have like Holy. you could have people have advantage or something or better roles on steering the fucking minecarts if they got vehicle proficiency. Like give some unit proficiency. Yes, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. You could oh, have mine part stuff. dungeon that'd be so you could cool. have you could have like oh if you have proficiency with mining or depending on the background you have if you know how to use a pickaxe to mine you got a chance of you know finding some rare gems or a rare mm. magical item that you mm. could use you know you could get creative with it and then like, like uh, burrowing earth creatures that yeah. they'd have to like kind of live off the you worms feel like in you feel like a druid you could go badger and just use your burrows. <laughs> there's so much stuff you could do ah yeah that would be a reason to let your players have a burrow speed and it wouldn't be overpowered anymore. That would be so a reason good. to let your players benefit from literally any now ability that like they had that isn't called that focus. Or something. That'd be really cool. Dude, that Mold Earth so would cool. be like a necessary oh, cantrip. Oh, Mold Earth would be like a lifesaver. Dude, imagine you're like, yeah. you're doing your mining duty for the day. You find a hidden cavern geode or whatever. There's a there's like a crystalline creature in there. You kill it and you get the horde. That's so The mending cool. cantrip will be useful. The awesome. pressure mm. dissertation can't be useful because let's say you broke out of your shackles. You could use it to create fake shackles mm. to pretend that you're still like in <laughs> yes. yeah. There's a lot of I mean, I imagine can... the enslavement process is more than just shackles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they probably got their ways, but also at the same time, I would imagine that well, for for the case of your, your players, the like players they would have to be one particularly uh lax DAO that you know, they got cocky. They let their guard down. Yeah. I mean, I could see them getting their guard down for a step block like that. I would be cocky too. God damn. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Fuck with me. Most like mortals yeah. wouldn't even know what a DAO was. Especially like, if they got the constitution, innate spell casting. I would, I would be cocky too, man. God damn. Yeah. And I mean, that's not yeah. even counting like this magic items they probably would have. Like, yeah. What they would have learned, yeah. you know. I, I think it would be an amazing campaign to be honest. Really fun. I think they would work as fantastic like traveling merchants. <laughs> and like, you know, maybe maybe you don't mess with their slave trade. Maybe they give you like an extra oh, inventory. You know? Yeah, that They're trope like, of like, yeah. oh, look at this fresh oh, harmless God. NPC that I can clearly oh. kill for fun. And they're like, Oh, oh you done goof. They're a level 20 arch wizard in this. <laughs> Dude, imagine <laughs> might like, as well be big bad, right? And you're like, you know what? I know a good place for you. Let's not kill him, guys. It's like, what if the Avatar game tries to fuck with the Cabbage Man and it turns let's, out let's he's actually this big bad to the this Eldritch God or something. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it turns out the Cabbage Dude. Man was the Fire Lord in disguise all along. You're like, hey, Mr. Dow Merchant. So much you potential. Want this, you want this lich? <laughs> yeah. like, they're like, hey, yo, you got yeah, I think. Yeah, I think in general, <laughs> overall, I rate this rock and stone out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock and stone. These are definitely oh. a befriend and oh, buy God. from type of. Uh, <laughs> type of <character>. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be on their bad side. No, I don't think you want to be on any of their sites, to be honest. That is true. Honestly, yeah, be, out of their being way. on their good side might get you is going to get you on society's bad side. I mean, but about, you know, you, you might be alive humor. though. <laughs> if I don't, if I'm on their right side, I might just get hit with the point of that hammer. <laughs> this is true. If I'm like on their back side, I might get hit with that sending my face. into our homebrew segment. Oh. oh, absolutely. Generic realm, generic realm, lots of fun, excellent. <laughs> All right. You excellent to each other. Yes. That's a reference. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
it's a very different reference, but it is a reference. I mean, the, the guitar riff really reminded me of that movie, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I can't, I can't blame you because like uh, they're just like, oh, it's yeah, like it's so cool. Exactly the right vibe. Yeah, it it's a good vibe. The guitar. Honestly, <laughs> now Sam, uh, yes. given uh, how big a monster that was, I'm gonna. I thankfully I have a very small homebrew this week. Oh. I present to you guys. The yeah. fortune teller feet. Oh yeah, you're right. You mentioned it. Let me take a look. Now, uh, the fortune teller feet. I mean, let me just uh, adjust this for our Maybe viewers us, here. Like, uh, give us a link or something. Now that I remember, I might have seen this one. I might have. Well, yeah, I think I might thankfully, have uh, Sam, I, I'll be. I'll let you know what this does here. So the prerequisite is, is you got to be able to cast a spell in Makes some sense. way. Oh, okay. yeah, you know, see it, see it. You got, you're kind of like attuned to the weave in some way. Okay. Your magic lets you see glimpses of the future. Do you and got them? divine. Yeah. So you can, your magic lets you see glimpses of the future and divine oh, how best to proceed. It? It's on the, it's on the screen. On the screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a link after, okay. but like, uh, so y you gain the following benefits, a plus one to your intelligence, wisdom, or const uh, charisma. Okay. You learn the augury spell and can cast it as a ritual spell. Makes sense. As a reaction, uh, when a hostile creature ends its turn within 30 feet of you, you can momentarily see into the future. The DM must tell you where that creature intends to move on its following turn. Oh. If the creature has not moved or been moved from its position at the start of its next turn, the creature must use all of its movement to move as close to the location the DM specified as possible. Okay. By the end of that creature's turn, you can use this. Okay, okay, by the end of the creature's turn. Uh, you can use this ability once and regain the ability to do so again on a short or long rest. Mm -hmm. You can also expend a spell slot of any level to use this ability again. Oh, look at that. I like it. It, does the feet end on that? Yes, it does. Okay, okay. Yeah, that is a really that's cool. Not bad. That's not it's bad. Very creative. I, very creative. I like that. Like it, it gives you, a, it gives the DM control over a situation, and it makes you feel like you're seeing the future. You know? Yeah, I could see this even going forward as well as like uh, you see it like an attack option or something. It's you see it, it, you see it spell yeah. before it uses it. You know. It's very yeah, clever tactics. because it specifies that the DM has to be the one to say where the creature is going to go. Not mm -hmm. you, right? You're not yeah. the one deciding where it's going to go. The DM is deciding. So in a way, you're yeah. forcing the DM to force things to happen in a certain way. And then you, the flavor yeah. is that it was always going to happen that way. You just predicted it. You know? Right. That's a clever yeah, way of because, doing it, you know? Yeah, and it, it's almost metagamey. But yeah, not even, at the same time. I can see it being like it's, you could twist it. You it's know, flavoring the meta gaming as future side. That's the you're like you're like yeah, this creature yeah. will move here, but doesn't tell you that it jumps there, it teleports there. Oh yeah, it yeah, runs yeah. around. It's gonna move. It just it just, it just tells you that it ends up there. Ooh, you know what yeah, I mean? No, really cool. Really cool like idea. It. Very very clever. Yeah. Very creative. Very unique. Like it could still like come up and attack you. It just ends its turn in this space. I also like the yeah. only only being able to be cast through this feat as a ritual specifically. It makes yeah, sense like, like for the flavor of it because she's divining it. It's not instant, you know. Yeah. You have to actually like focus on a situation. Yeah. Or... I can only able to cast it as a ritual. It doesn't specify that you can use a spell slot to cast it. You can only cast yeah. it through this feat as a ritual. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's a way cool. of balancing it yeah. and making it more flavorful, in mm -hmm. my opinion. I could see this, you know, definitely growing with, you know, the 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 caster. This zone definitely took like a different approach from how I did the fortune teller feat. Mm -hmm. And I like that it went in a completely different direction. I love it. Oh, you did one as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mentioned that like, I just didn't post it yet. It's part oh. of my endless backlog of I see, I stuff that see. is finished and ready to go, and I just haven't made the document for you because the document takes more time than writing. <laughs> yeah, shout out to the creator of that because fortune teller feat. I like it. No, I absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, the, the creator fun. of this is uh, Slade Man. Uh, I think I've... Uh, I might have talked about one of his homebrews in the past because like, I know I've seen his work. I, I browse so much uh, 
unearthed arcana on reddit it's crazy. this will be my uh first time <laughs> I, I think talking about a homebrew monster so that's pretty cool you also right. got a homebrew monster yeah oh we own the monster. This will be interesting. Move on to this one. Yeah, I, I was scrolling through and I saw this. And I was like, oh, oh send me the link. Oh, I want to look at it. What the hell is this? Oh, uh, yeah, I got you right here. Uh, awesome. awesome. Ryan doesn't do it first. Uh, I'm going to pull it up for the on the stream so uh, our yeah, viewers can check that the, out. Because that's a whole lot of you. monster right there, buddy. It's it's something. Whoa. I, I saw this and I was just like, holy shit. How did you come across this one? I was just scrolling through uh, from Reddit. On Reddit, really? But were you scrolling yeah. like, like top of the month or top of the year or some shit? Um, I'm not sure. I was because this is five months like, yeah. like yeah. how did it appear on your feed if it's so? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I'm glad it did because it looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, but it just it looks really fucking cool. Maybe he yeah. was like actively searching for something, and he had like hmm. a certain keyword. I'm not sure. Oh, could be. Anyway, it's just our so. In the accursed lands of the ruinlit expanse, a Ooh. chilling and tragic transformation awaits those who fall victim to the Iron Curse. Once ordinary humans, they evolved into the terrifying Verudi, Veridurin, I believe. Very <laughs> being the, varying, being ensnared by the relentless gr grasp of the malevolent curse. Very the good. Iron Curse slowly consumes their essence, infusing them with a vivid blood-red hue marking the beginning of their gruesome metamorphosis. The twisted transformation commences with the lower extremities of the afflicted creature. The legs wither and harden, taking on a sinister tree-like texture wow. as the curse progresses. As the transformation advances, the afflicted creatures become immobile, their bodies rooting deeply into the crimson earth. <laughs> their once recognizable forms giving way to a grotesque visage akin to a blood-red tree. The Verudians so cool. become trapped in a horrific existence, part creature and part plant, uh, forever marked by their tragic consequences of meddling with the celestial forces of the runelit expanse. <laughs> this is so <laughs> cool. It's so heavy. I love it. I, I, I'm curious about this runelit expanse. So the runelit expanse is apparently something created by this, uh, this homebrew yeah, creator. It, it sounded like their own setting, yeah. 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 Oh, I do oh, have a the second page here. does it, right? The second uh -huh. page covers it. Yeah. Cool. Can we talk about it a little bit? <clears throat> so getting into this creature here, it is a medium plant, chaotic evil. Armor class of 15. Oh, I'm so Strength of 16, dexterity of 10, constitution of 20, oh, toughness of 7, wisdom of 12, and charisma of 6. Uh, looks to have damage resistances of bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing uh, right. from non-magical attacks. Understands common but cannot speak, and is a challenge rating four. So pretty basic as far as you know stats go, except for that constitution. <laughs> so yeah, we have keen smell. Yeah, has advantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on smell. Excuse me, I gotta. Bless oh, you. Yeah. Yeah, oh thank damn! You. <laughs> uh, so we have to rolls. Iron-bound form, the Viridian's legs are now tree-like and rooted in place, making it immobile. It has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. Its attacks also deal an additional 2d6 piercing damage as thorns pierce through the branch-like limbs. Okay, mm. cool. And then we have false appearance. While motionless, the Viridian is indistinguishable from a young blood-red tree. A DC-15 wisdom perception check reveals its true nature. <laughs> I love how it's like bolded there. Yeah. Bolded in really cool. red specifically. I like that. You know, and then this that's, thing has, you know, yeah, multi attack, a claw with a slam, as well as ironwood grasp. Come the Verudian targets one creature it can see within 30 feet. The target must succeed on DC 15 strength saving throw or be restrained. Taking 2d10 piercing damage at the start of each of its turns. Oh. Creature restrained by the Viridian can use its action to make a DC 15 strength check, freeing itself on success. So, this is a slowly drain you by grappling you and bleeding you dry with the thorns type of. Wow. Of Damn, these abilities are really cool, but they also right. seem really strong. I, I, is this a CR4? Is it really just yeah. a CR4? Dude. I imagine, like, you have a few of these things. Oof. 
I mean, they don't. Yeah, because like uh, if they if they had like a grove, that yeah. would go hard. That like, stumble into like a clearing of these. Oh, I man. think this is beyond CR four, to be honest. But it's hella Maybe. cool. It's hella Next cool. Up, we have Iron Curse. Any creature grappled by the Viridian must succeed on a DC fifteen Con saving throw at the start of each of its turns, or begin slowly turning into a Viridian. The speed is reduced by 10 feet and gains vulnerability to fire damage. Dang. The transformation okay. is okay. permanent unless removed by greater restoration spell or similar magic. Oh, so you could legit just... Av- so you could avoid the entire uh, conflict oh. by just using greater restoration. Yeah. I mean, could you? you? Could, You're just you avoiding the transformation on yourself. These things, right? Yeah, man. I wonder if you could cure these. I mean, I, they look they look too far gone. You, you will here. probably want to do the greater restoration after you've killed the thing because there's yeah. nothing that text is specifying that after you do greater restoration, yeah, you you're like immune because, to it. You can just something. go and do it again, you know. Yeah, they, if they grapple you, you're fucking cooked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm telling bro, this, this we have two on. we have two yeah. bonus actions here. It makes them. I feel like bonus actions on creatures make them a lot stronger. Ah, uh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Like next up, this is. I, I think you're right. This might be like uh, the the shade of CR4. I feel like because, you know, I don't know, man. I could see it. Shadow, yeah, the like shadow. Situation. If it didn't have the bonus you know? action, I think I could see it CR4, yeah. but he having those bonus actions, bro, nah. First up, we have Thorn Burst being a recharge five or six. The Virudian unleashes a burst of razor sharp thorns in a 20 foot radius centered on itself. Each creature in the area must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, taking 66 piercing damage on a fail. Half as much on success. Additionally, creatures that fail the saving throw are restrained by the thorns until they use an action to make a DC 15 strength check to break free. Uh, then we have Entangling Vines. The Verudian releases Entangling Vines from its body to ensnare a creature it can see within 30 feet. The target must succeed on a DC 15 strength saving throw or be restrained until the start of its turn. Okay. Yeah, no, there's a pretty that's good. A, that's pretty, pretty good. Solid. Yeah. I, I, I love the like everything like DC this, DC this, DC this, yeah. all of this it doesn't, specifically it doesn't remember like it doesn't it. move, but it specifically wants to mm. hold you in place. I like it. Very yeah, I think the it's only thing tying it down to CR four like, like, no yeah, I, like I think a, I get why they it put it being this tied down. down. Yeah. I mean it is super it with the fire. Move, like, right? Too. It doesn't move. So yeah. yeah, logic dictates that if you just stay for a distance, you can kill it. Without yeah. that much, and it, and it has some in, some ensnaring. It doesn't seem to have any way to pull you closer to it. Yeah. So that's I mean, unless you're why a melee. They put it as CR four. Yeah. Unless you're like yeah, a melee. Yeah. This is an ambush really type of uh, thing where yeah, it's just like it tricks you into coming sure, closer. Like, like, hey, I'm yeah. a tree. You know. Yeah, I'm just the tree, man. Come, and come, take a piss on me. You could technically <laughs> flavor this as a, a special type of mimic, and it will work perfectly well. Oh God! Like a yeah. tree mimic. Oh. You could flavor this as a tree mimic. Like an evil tree. Really well. Hmm? I can so, see that. One last bit of flavor text here. The Viridian's existence is a stark reminder of the hubris that led to the moon shattering and the enduring torment that has brought upon the runelit expanse. Adventurers who encounter these creatures must tread carefully, for the Viridians are not simply twisted beings. They are living remnants of a devastating catastrophe. Really cool. Dude, so the art out. for the Runelit Expanse. No, uh, like, out to this creator. Charts. Relkitaku, I believe. I don't, I'm not oh, really sure not. how to say it, but shout out to all this. The Runelit Expanse stuff seems really fucking mm. cool. I'm gonna check out. Dude, it's beautiful. Yeah, we would we would love to you know talk more about this. Maybe we can figure out what's going on with the Runelit Dude, Expanse. Let's get this guy on the show <laughs> and talk yeah, about this. Cool. Get out of this stupid perfectionist. Get this guy. <laughs> Honestly, like if you're gonna if you're gonna be like, hey, I need to make up all these uh, homebrews and stuff. Well, he like, did more maybe what you need is a good story. partner. Like this yeah, this man knows how to put something like together. There's way more creatures. There's a, a dragon, hemo, there's a hemo dragon or whatever. It's there's a skeletal cool. blood mage from the ruin expanse. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Oh. Wow. I like it. Well, but, yeah, I think this episode is getting a little long, so that's all I have for you guys. <laughs> all right. Okay, I, I brought. Uh, I'm gonna follow him. I brought yeah. a homebrew as well, right? Is that okay? Oh yeah. Go ahead and close this out with it. I I I found it really fun, and says, oh, "Okay, if I'm gonna 
bring a homebrew piece to look at with the guys as well. So, you know, the one that came to my was ah, definitely yes. one. It was, uh, it was ah, just, yes, yeah, it's like, because it's like, you, you remember what I said, right? Usually it's like, whatever is on my mind is this type, is a type of stuff that is inspiring me right now or amusing me right now, be it a meme, an internet reference, a franchise, a video game, an anime, whatever. Usually that's the kind of stuff that is going to inspire me the most and be the most fun to turn into a homebrew. And it didn't get to that point with Hell Divers 2. But I was into it. Yes. I was into it. And then a beautiful day I go on North Dracona and I see this fucking beauty, right? <laughs> oh yeah. my god. Sacred oath of Holy the hell shit. diver. <laughs> Bro. I god. see this Ooh. shit and then I look at the outro and it's my boy, the goose quill. My boy, my the goose, goose quill. Boy. Oh, we love you, buddy. Yo, you yo. do good work. He's on my server too, man. I love the. I believe we had the goose quill on once. You did. We did. We did. He was a cool yeah, dude. When I saw he was here, I was like, dude, post this on the other subreddit for the love of oh, God. Man. And then he did. That's so cool. And then he did well. I was like, so happy. Yes. Because if you post it on the main mm -hmm. Helldiver subreddit, more people that don't frequent your North Arcana are going to see your stuff. You know, the thing with like reference brews, you have to to post an outside the, the usual yeah. sort. You have to post it on the wider net, right? And There's the a lot of overlap, you know? Dedicated, like, franchise subreddit. If I made, for example, a Friday Night Funkin' Bard, which I did, I got to post it on the Friday Night Funkin' subreddit. I can't just have it limited to the North Arcana, you know? You got you to gotta right. show it to, to more people who might not be that, be, might not be that into D&D, &D, but they're sure as hell are into the thing you're making a D&D &D brew off, you know? So I, I saw this one. I was like, yes. Yes, I was so happy. Oh, absolutely. And then I was like, oh, before he, like, he posted, like did a second post on the main Helldiver subreddit, I, on, my, on my Discord server, I was like, man, the only thing I would change about it is like maybe add an optional feature about firearms, you know, since they use mm. guns in the game. And he was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll add that in. And then he just added it in and then made the second post. I was like, mm. beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> I love yeah, that's it. That's really cool. Would you guys, like, shout out to the you guys like to read it or should I read it? Um, I mean, that is quite a lot. <laughs> 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 I'm uh, looking at it now. You definitely link it in our description too. Oh yeah, yeah, it's good to link it. I think yeah, I put it on the chat. Oh yeah, that's I can really try it fast if you want. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you, Ryan. Go for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can make it fun. Well, we can speed run this. <laughs> go right ahead. Running. Okay. Let's let me see. Well, let me see what I can do. To take the old Thank you then, the hell diver, means to dedicate one's life to the fight for peace, liberty, and more than anything, manage democracy. It means to fight the good fight against otherworldly threats which seek to undo the fabric of civilization as we know it. The tenets of the hell diver, my blood is freedom. I will not conspire with oppressors of liberty. My blade is liberating. I will rid the oppressed from their shackles and guide them on a path to freedom. My allegiance is to democracy. I will not show its enemies mercy, for mercy is reason. Oaf spells. Fog cloud and jump. Pyrotechnics and dark vision. Haste and slow. <laughs> Faithful hound and wall of fire. Conjure volley and, you gotta have it, flame strike. Gotta have that orbit. Yes. Channel divin <clears throat> Channel democracy. When you take this over to <laughs> level, you get the following two channel divinity options. See the sacred oath class feature for how channel divinity works. Help off. <laughs> you can use your channel divinity to call for reinforcements in the heat of battle. As an action, you may choose one unconscious friendly creature within 60 feet of you. On the start of that creature's next turn, it regains one hit point. Additionally, you may use a number of hit dice equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of one, to restore hit points. The allied creature then chooses a location within 30 feet of you, to which it is immediately teleported. I like. I would probably flavor that as like the actual pod, but you know, for, for mechanical hmm. sake, I think he just went with a simpler phrase. Yeah. Immediately teleported. Okay, I get it. 
Makes if the sense. space yeah. to reach the ally, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, if the space ahead. to reach the ally creature teleports is already occupied, all other creatures must make a dex 30 saving throw equal to your spell save DC. Didn't need to specify that part, but it's okay. Or take 2d8 <laughs> plus your levels in this class. Could have just say plus your paladin level. Bludgeoning damage. Regardless of whether the creature makes this save or not, it has pushed the nearest available occupied space. After the creature is teleported, it is no longer considered prone, but can only move up to half its movement speed and take either an action or a bonus action, not both. It just got reinforced into the battlefield after all. Similar to the game, I like it. Resupply. Mm. As part of a short rest, you can use your channel divinity to call in additional supplies. At the end of the short rest, four creatures of your choice, which I imagine can include yourself, gain an additional hit die to regain hit points. Mm, nice. That's Most good. people in the subreddit thought this was a little more underwhelming, but considering help out, it's probably pretty good. I think it's okay, right? A little big, strong one, and other useful, but more so situational, maybe. Like, and I think it's like focusing on the flavor, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. Like, you, you could see the thing I liked about this one is because, of course, it's, it's not exactly how I would have done it if I were to have tried to do something like this. But, like, the choice of class, the choice of naming, you know, channel democracy, you know, the, the, yes. the, the design, like, which is, it, this is not like the usual homebrew design. This is not something that looks like Watsi would have made it. It is specifically made to emulate like, the style of Helldivers, you know? Yeah, so like, like I'm I'm not familiar with it, but like I know of Helldivers, and I'm just appreciating everything about this. Like yeah, no, I'm so glad that like, you're reading this off because like yeah, you're really selling it. Thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to do the democracy the whole thing. It's really the whole vibe of Helldivers, you know. For Super Earth, did you know that the planet is literally Super Earth? It's literally the mm. canonical name of it. Yeah, that's why they I have like, the, the bugs. It's not America. Stuff, right? It's not Earth. It's Super Earth. I love it. It's just the goofiest <laughs> thing, you know. It's just the goofiest thing. Amazing vibe. It, it's... So, uh, sorry. Mm. No, no, speak. I, I was just thinking, like, it's that kind of, uh, it's that kind of uh, over the top, this is awesome exactly. vibe, and that kind of energy. It's yeah, like, like a, the, America, I wanna... fuck yeah, but as a game. And this is that game. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I want to, I, I don't know what the actual term for it is, but I call it pseudo awesome, where it's oh, just like something awesome. is like, it, it's awesome. just like it really proclaims itself as being like, hey, fuck yeah, like yeah. over the top, over satirical. the top awesome, like yeah, Scott Pilgrim. Satirical, yeah. Yeah, like satirical awesome, like the pseudo awesome, you know, where it's just like, I, I get oh it. yeah. I get what you mean. Yeah, it could work. Absolutely. So, like, I, I like it because. Even though it's not exactly how I would have done it, it follows the same principle of I'm going to try and translate not just, you know, what it is, how it works, if it's a video game, the mechanics of that the, the are in the game, you know, into the subclass or the brew or whatever, but pretty much yes. the vibe. Like, to really get the vibe, you got to be a fan of that film, right? Like, I did a Tekken right. set of feats because I'm a really, real big Tekken fan. It was the first, like fighting game that i ever played it's part of my childhood you know so as a right. big fan of it i get the vibe you know and this is what i feel like he 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 played the game he played with his friends he got the vibe like he understood the <laughs> assignment you know he got it men understood the assignment it was just mm, amazing there are some tweaks of course there are some balances that other people would do of course but he he understood the assignment he got the vibe perfectly and i very appreciate it for yeah. him what do you think so far, Sam? Yeah, everyone's playing, so it's not hard to find one of your streamers that you like to watch just going at it. All right. All right. Let me continue with that. This is a this is probably the the most like debated part of the subclass that I saw in the comments of each post. Like Oh, the yeah. feature right here is gonna it's gonna turn some heads for sure. Aura of Liberty. 
In starting at 7th level, you inspire creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you with the righteous justice of freedom. While you're not incapacitated, you and creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you do not suffer penalties to their attack rolls from external sources, such okay. as disadvantage from the frostbite cantrip or modifiers such as the bane spell. When you reach 18th level in this class, the aura affects creatures within 30 feet of you. Yeah, this one's That's not bad. All right. It's bonkers, bro. Because it's so broad. It's like, you and creatures of your trust in 10 feet of you, okay, the normal range of a paladin aura, just do not suffer any penalties to their attack rolls from any experience. Yeah. When you say external sources, it can be interpreted as anything that is not you. Mm -hmm. Which really yeah. amounts to I, literally anything. Literally anything, yeah. You're never going to get yeah, this advantage. I, you're never going to get a negative modifier. You're never going to get anything that transforms your attack roll from anything beyond a normal attack roll. But you still get benefits. Yeah. You can still get benefits. You're just never going to get any negative influence over your attack roll. Considering how broad yeah. that is and how useful that is, like you're just never going to get a debuff to your attacks ever. Yeah. I think like as a DM, I would rule it that that would be external things like it says. But like uh, environmental would be something else entirely. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, mm -hmm. say you're slipping on a surface. Okay, well that that's that thing. But like mm -hmm. any active effects or things that would try mm -hmm. to affect you, that mm -hmm. none of those. Yeah, maybe a specification like anything that specifically targets you or the allies within your aura. Right? Yeah, uh, I would I would do that. Like, oh, if it's a debuff spell or effect that's specifically targeting you yeah. or a creature within your aura, it doesn't work. But if it's like an area yeah. effect, or like oh, difficult terrain. I mean, to be fair, it, it doesn't specify that it specifically debuffs that affect your attack rolls. Mm -hmm. But I, mm. I, I do still think that it's possibly too broad. You know, like if someone mm. says, yeah, maybe just a little, strong, little you know, bit more definition. Yeah, a little more specification as to not be so completely applicable to anything that affects your attack rolls in any way. You know, because if someone it, it, if it is supposed to be like that, completely like anything that would ever affect your attack rolls negatively just doesn't work. Like if someone looks at that and says that is too strong, I, I wouldn't blame them. You know, I wouldn't be mad at them for saying that. Right. Yeah. But it's kind of cool. Just a little tweak. But it's kind of fucking cool. Like even if balance wise, like it could it. use some tweaks. You can see the vision. You can see the concept. You know, like mm. part of liberty. You're liberated from anything that will fuck up your attack rolls. You're always going to be attacking right. You're always going to be attacking well. I love that. It makes perfect sense, you know? It's a great mechanical translation of the concept he's trying to go for. And on brand with what we were talking about earlier with freeing, with freeing slaves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technically so. This would be perfect for it. I mean, it, the Helldivers does a, a little different kind of liberation, but hey, hey let's go, man. Hey, whatever works, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, liberty means different things to different people, apparently. <laughs> I mean, if you play Helldivers, they're probably going to understand what I mean. They're liberating All the right. democracy from anything undemocratic. And those giant bugs look very undemocratic to me. <laughs> communist bugs. <laughs> I mean, bugs are funnily enough, they aren't communist bugs, but they literally are <laughs> communist robots. They literally are communist robots in the game. They're the other type of enemy. Dude. <laughs> I love that. The commie bots. Commie robots. Uh, commie robots. That's great. I'm doing my part. At 15th level, when a friendly creature within 30 feet of you is hit with an attack by a creature that you can see, you may use your reaction to immediately, immediately move up to half your maximum speed and make one melee weapon attack against that creature without provoking an attack of opportunity. Okay. I'm doing Good. my part. That is a straight reference from the cutscene. I love actually nice. No, that's that's the cool thing. This game is heavily inspired by an old movie called Starship Troopers, right? Ah, the classic. Yeah, cult classic in the sci-fi genre. And I'm doing my part, if I'm not mistaken, is a reference from one of the movie scenes. But, but a phrase that nonetheless became a meme with the popularization of this game because it is directly inspired by the movie. Mm -hmm. 
So like that's the thing. You can see this person knows the references. He knows the memes. They're in the community, you know. They they play the game. They're a fan of it. Absolutely. I mean, you would imagine someone that goes through the trouble of making a subclass is a fan of the thing they're referencing, but still, yeah. you can see that they know what they're doing, that they get the references. So, like, as someone who knows the reference, they're like, oh, this is awesome. This is exactly the type of reference that I would want to put in if I was making this, you know? Right. Like, seeing someone yeah. do the exact type of brew that I like to do is like, ah, oh, that's so cool, you know? Yeah, there's something about, like, just seeing someone be like, hey, wait a minute, that's something that I would do in that way. Exactly, exactly. It's like, that's, it's like, like, the I whole reason it. you're doing it, right? Exactly. Like, He's like, oh, shit, he understands me. Could this be one? <laughs> just like yeah. me for real. You're just like me for real, for real. Could this yeah. be one of them? I like that a lot. Yeah, that, that was the vibe I, I got, that. which is why I'm like, okay, if there's a bro that I'm going to, like, review on the on the podcast it should it should be this one it's recent it spoke to me you know mm-hmm. it's based on a very mainstream thing right now so it makes sense to cover it i think you know mm-hmm. herald of mm-hmm. managed democracy at one of level you gain the ability to harness the full power of managed democracy as an action you become an avatar of liberty getting the following benefits benefits for one minute, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can make one additional attack as part of that action. You cannot be grappled, restrained, paralyzed, or stunned. If you are knocked unconscious while this feature is active, you may use your channel divinity help pod. Sorry, your channel democracy help pod <laughs> once <laughs> without needing to expand the use of your channel de- democracy to do so. Once while this feature is activated, you can use an action to cast Fireball at fifth level without expanding your spell slot. Oh, sure. Fireball's detonation is delayed, taking effect on the start of your next turn. That's probably a direct translation of one of the game's stratagems, which are like orbital strikes and attacks and shit. So mm-hmm. like directly, yeah. you're only going to know what this is referencing if you play the game or saw someone play it. But to be fair, it is kind of obvious that it's a kind of bomb of some sort, right? Yeah, so like, okay, as it, as it usually goes with Paladins, you get like a one minute super form, pretty much. Mm-hmm. But this one also lets you throw a fucking nuke. <laughs> that's pretty awesome throwing Fifth nukes is definitely fireball. on brand for, yeah. for hell diary yeah I dig it I mean I would maybe make a comment about balancing because it gives you the super form and a fireball 5th level etc but this is literally 20th level at that point you're supposed to be a demigod at that point wizards can literally change reality on a whim so you know you know yeah. at that point I don't care I, no, I look at absolutely. this and I, and I go no. hell you just yeah. let them have it at that point you know America, Why not? Fuck yeah, you know, super earth, fuck yeah. Once you use this feature, you can use it again until you finish a long rest. Optional feature the secrets of gunpowder weapons have been discovered in various corners of the DD multiverse. If your dungeon master uses the rules on firearms in the dungeon master's guide, you are proficient with them. And then there's the credits. Nice. Artwork used in this document is property of Arrowhead Game Studios. The content of this document is an official fan content permitted. <laughs> Not approved endorsed by Wizards, Potions, and Materials. Blah, 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 blah. Created by the Goose Quill. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to the Goose Quill. Shout out to the Goose Quill. I think it's probably going to enjoy this stream. <laughs> it's probably going to enjoy this podcast, this episode. I hope oh, for sure. I, I hope it's entertaining. So let's see it being a <laughs> I'm glad All you right. came, man. Nice to meet you. Glad you can. Ha <laughs> ha. But um, oh. what, what would you leave for the listeners and watchers out there? Like, and where who, can they find? May yeah. not know and, you. Yet. Yeah. Oh yeah. right, right. Yeah, and uh, where can they find you? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Funny enough, if you want, you could just link my link tree link. You could just link my link tree link. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <Not> yeah. <laughs> Yet. Fucking yeah! <laughs> the nerd militia only fans will come someday. Put all the homebrew on only fans. <laughs> on That's this the economy, hack right there. On this economy, <laughs> I ain't gonna rule it out, bro. We got all the spiciest homebrew on only fans. 
on this economy, I ain't ruling anything out, man. Yeah, dude, man. <laughs> but yeah, you got the link tree with Ko-Fi page, Reddit profile, Discord server, Instagram page, the home brewery gallery. Maybe sometime in the future, a patron. Who knows if I can find a way to make it work. All right. But yeah, this is, this is the places where you find me. Uh, if you want to always be up to date with anything I post, anything I do, you can join my Discord server. I make sure to ping literally everyone in it whenever I post something. I will use the everyone <laughs> tag. I will use it. Be warned. You are yeah. going to get pinged. <laughs> whether you like it or not. You're, you're right. You know. uh, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> you said yeah. that is your life. Hope you all <laughs> enjoy this. Yeah, if you don't mind being picked yeah. every time you make a brew, you can join it. You're gonna be up to date with anything I post. I also posting on Instagram now, just dumping all my backlog of stuff on it, creating a gallery, getting close to 300 followers, I think. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. nice. Eventually, when I well, we're... if slash when I do make a Patreon, I plan to advertise it there as well. So if you wanna be into that awesome no? follow me on those please i guess well please that's about the time we've too. got for please this follow them too. <laughs> yeah yeah awesome. that's about the time we've got this week Let's so sam and Ari see y'all next week have a good weekend everybody shield them more and keep on enjoying those games everyone follow these guys <laughs> hell diver <laughs> i haven't played right. it but i do recommend hell divers Try out Hell Divers. Hell yeah. <laughs> we at the Nerd Militia endorse Hell Divers. <laughs> we are not sponsored. Why not, right? Oh, well, we man. Would love to be. Hell Divers, sponsor us, please. Please. <laughs> <laughs>